Welcome to Ninja's Papers. Today we're going to paint up this Night Titan in under 24 hours. So I've seen a lot of different people doing 24 hour challenges with building uh, 2000 points uh, within 24 hours, painting them up. I'm not to that ability just yet, but I figured I could try to create a Night Titan in under 24 hours hours all right um which is something of an accomplishment for me because the last night titan i did uh, it took me six months so that that would be reducing the time so see how much quality i can get in under 24 hours well let's go down to the table town Alrighty, so uh time to paint up this night titan now uh it took me about six hours to actually build this exoskeleton right here uh so let's paint it up all right so i'm going to start off with some vallejo metal color steel it's such a great rich color and i want to talk a little bit about you know the process of this challenge and of course i challenge you to try to build and paint a night titan in under 24 hours all right that was the challenge in which i set to you now i didn't speed up the process here I kind of just like took the raw footage and I wanted this to be a little bit of a paint and chat. So I wanted to do that with you guys uh, right here so you can see my process. All right, so the exoskeleton was completely built. Uh, I didn't say I was gonna build it in under 24 hours, but paint it. So uh, I do have that separate and I painted it up a nice steel-like color. Uh, and uh, I started using that wash, that oil wash, which is really great to create grime and soot. Now, it's an important thing to remember to let that oil wash dry for at least 24 hours. So you take the exoskeleton, you painted it up, you, you included the zenithal highlighting and all the stuff that you want to do with it. Then you go to put that wash on it and then you just set it aside, period. Do not touch it. You may think it's dry. It's not dry. Okay. Oil takes a long, considerably longer time to dry uh, than any other kind of paint. Uh, so you got to give it that time uh, to settle into the recesses and dry. All right, so let's talk about uh, oil washes. I like Winton oil color, and I'm using a uh, brown color here uh, as well as black. I want the soot to be black ish brown uh if that makes any sense here and what i'm using in that little cup there is some mineral spirits i like to use min odorless mineral spirits uh in order to dilute the oil paint and i like to use these uh disposable cups i got it from a um i think i got it from sam's club or was it costco and i got a multi-pack in there and it's for like ketchup and other condiments and stuff like that that you see at these uh faster foods restaurants or, or some of these restaurants that have uh sauces and stuff like that i use it for my painting all right next is a very long and tedious process here is taking this oil paint and breaking it down so this way it is liquid form so since these oil pieces are very heavy body, it takes a while for it to actually um, dissolve. But once you have it all dissolved, uh, it, it really does help. I take a separate oil brush, very large one you see right there, that I think I picked up at Michael's uh, or some kind of art supply store. It was uh, relatively cheap. I think I spent $7 for an entire set. Uh, the set is actually called Nicole. Ironically, Nicole is the name of my wife. So there you go. She's always a part of my art. Okay, so I'm just going to, uh, you see, I'm going to uh, heavily apply the oil wash to the entire exoskeleton right here, every area that has uh, steel. Again, I want it to be like very, very dark. And that was my theme right there. Now, alternatively, you can do 
a zenithal highlight with a lighter steel or chromish color from the top if you wanted this steel to be a lot brighter but i really wanted it to be yeah, like that black steel kind of color and that's what i was going for so this was just very dark and it's very easy process now getting it on there you see that i have i'm holding it with a gloved hand right there and the reason why i'm holding with a gloved hand is because this stuff will get all over the place <laughs> yeah i'm not going to sugarcoat that stuff also look at the bottom there i have some cardboard in which i put that down uh, the oil paint has a habit of uh seeping through things so with the oil with the cardboard down if it's going to seep it's going to seep on the cardboard and i'm not really worried about that also it's a little bit, um, It's you can move it around on the cardboard a little bit better. Uh, it's a little more stable, but because, you know, once you do this, you do have to let it dry for quite some time. So you see uh, it, the oil paint itself takes forever to, um, to dry, and it really does. And the reason why is because it's just so heavy bodied, right? And it's oil and not water, so it doesn't really evaporate that easily. Okay, so next up, what we're going to do here are the shoulder pads. Now we're done with the exoskeleton. We're putting it over to the side, so this way no one can touch it for the next 24 to 48 hours, depending, right? Depending on your area, how much humidity you have, and the area that you're working on. Now I'm using FW ink here. I'm using an ink to create this white. I have a lot of white different kind of paint and I'm really do like the ones that are coming from creature caster um, that a fan actually gave to me thank you Mike McBroom for uh, hooking me up with that wipe but I wanted to use this FW ink right now and really try to use it to its potential so I took quite a few layers I do like using ink through airbrushes because it, it just comes out so smoothly and you to see me go back and forth with the white you know I'm really trying to get uh, opaque white and it's going over black so it's going to take a while <laughs> so be patient with this process i do it several times but you can see it's coming up really bright and brilliant all right so next up i am going to hit this with a gloss varnish there are a lot of different gloss varnishes you can use i'm using vallejo gloss varnish but there are so many different ones ak interactive comes to mind um and, and i do have several and the ones that I have, I'm trying to use up. So there you go. Now, the reason why I do gloss varnish is because I'm actually going to mask off areas and I'm going to use masking tape. And I don't want this paint job, this work to get pulled up what's, you know, at all. So I just firmly want to protect it. Okay, so another layer here, what I'm doing is I'm going around the edges and I'm putting a little bit of Seraphon Sepia. Now I do like to have this like brownish effect going around the edges whenever I paint white. I feel white is way too stark and it needs something to contrast with it. And brown is absolutely perfect, especially going for the grim dark future where things are kind of dirty. Brown does do a great job. Uh, and Seraphon Sepia is a uh, wash, but I love putting washes through an airbrush because it just gives a subtle transition. Like it really brings it up slowly and easy to control. And you can see how great it really does look. Um, <laughs> and it does mat down the edges quite. All right, so time for masking. Now with masking, I use Silly Putty for a lot of things, but when I want to create some straight lines, uh, I usually use painter's tape. This is frog tape this is the one i've been using but they've come uh another one for delicate surfaces but i want to finish this up before i even try to use that one uh so i'm just using these uh blue uh tape works just as fine uh just make sure that when you're actually cutting the lines to push in the small crevices because wherever is exposed uh, paint's gonna get in there, you know, and you don't want it to bleed, and that's what it's called bleeding, bleeding over to the surface you've already painted. And in my case, if I'm painting red, I don't want it to get over to the white side. So just make sure you can go with a toothpick or something, a sharp object that won't rip the tape, uh, and then just go over the edges, uh, making sure that it's completely sealed before you apply the paint. 
Back to Tabletown. All right, welcome back to Tabletown here. Uh, I'm going to use this masking tape uh, right here. And this one, frog tape in particular, is uh, very sticky. <laughs> very sticky. And I found it like it started to fight me a little bit. So, you know, um, I don't know, try different uh, masking tapes and see what works best for you. Tamaya has an excellent range of masking tape, and I do have those uh, as well. But I wanted something really big and thick so it can co cover the entire shoulder pad right there. So I fiddled around with this quite some bit. And I think it, it might be because of the gloss varnish, it really just didn't want to adhere. So it started giving me a little bit of problems here um, <laughs> to get it down. I mean, ultimately, I, I got what I wanted to get. But here is... <laughs> Here is a very, very fun fact, because with all this work that I'm doing right here, I don't want to cover up the black area of the, <laughs> of the shoulder pad. So I'm actually doing something really, and I didn't realize this, So, but you know, hey, this is how we roll. Either way, I pull it off when I realize, uh, and I'm like, um, hello, what am I, what am I doing here? <laughs> and you know, I, I started going back and um, trying to get all the, the paint off my glove right there so nothing can stick, you know, I'm very concerned about that. And um, I saw some of the speckles going on to the white end and I wanted to get that off. Now you see, I feel confident with actually pressing the uh, tape onto the white areas because of that gloss varnish. But here's the thing, this is quite insane. I do it again. <laughs> Anywho, I, I'll get it this time. This time I got it. This time I got it. All right, so I'm going to cover up the white side. And the transition that I get on these shoulder pads, actually, I'm very, very proud of. I do like uh, the red transition. Now, normally I paint light blue because a lot of people see me do the Space Wolves. Um, my Stormcast Eternals are like a, a tealish. But when it comes to red, uh, I, I mean, I do have my Flesh Eater Quartz, which have red accents to it, but I really do like doing red. Like, I like doing a burgundy uh, burnish red. It's so much fun to do, and I'm going to show you how to do that right there. Again, pressing the tape can take time. And... You may want to use something in order to get the, the ridges just so. I'm using the back end of the X-Acto blade, but I, I do recommend you using a uh, toothpick. That also is very handy as well. All right, so everything is taped up. Uh, I'm going to start off with a base red. Uh, this is Mephiston red, which is base red in uh, Citadel, but you can use any red. I highly encourage you to experiment with the colors that you have and uh, just do a process like this. You know, so you need a dark, deep, rich red, right? Uh, and then you're going to need a mid-tone red and then finally a bright red just so I can get, you know, that transition from dark recesses to highest highlight all on one shoulder pad, especially when you have a large shoulder pad, like a shoulder pad from a Night Titan, which is huge. So you'd really want to show some transitions and, you know, show off some, some airbrush work here. And it does help. Uh, when you have these very large uh, panels to be able to, you know, you get the freedom to be able to show like a really deep transition. So yeah, there's the base color right now. Notice uh, I am holding the airbrush uh, a bit away. I am using a higher pressure right here. Um, for some reason, I'm still getting used to the Iowata uh, Eclipse. Uh, there's always been, uh, when it comes to airbrushes, I've always been a fan of um, the... Well, I had another uh, airbrush that I used to use. Oh, good golly, and it's not coming to me right now. But it wasn't an Iowata. Uh, so, you know, I had different airbrushes, and this one right now, I'm just trying to get used to. Um, it was a renegade. That's what it was. <laughs> now I remember. I have uh, four airbrushes. So I, I kind of like flip back and forth. But I want to get used to each one. And each airbrush that I own has its own quirks, you know, and own, own learning curve. And this one itself is just 
I don't know, it's kind of odd. Uh, I get a lot of uh, backflow and it kind of clogging up a little bit, which I'm not really used to. So I tend to like wash it out or use a higher pressure uh, just so I can like blast anything that's in the chamber out and uh, continue painting because you know uh, the less time I fiddle around with the airbrush the more time I'm painting the more I'm getting accomplished and especially with a 24 hour build and paint uh, then <laughs> This is definitely uh, something that I'm going to have to pay attention to as far as using time. And I don't even want to use that time to clean the airbrush as much as I just want to paint. All right, I'm doing a face mask as well with that base color. And it really is a deep burgundy, especially because you're painting over black. The, the black behind it, since red is transparent, it's going to pick up on the paint. So instead of it being a bright red right here, which you see it turn bright red, but then when it when it dries, it always dries like a little darker or flatter than when it when the way the when the paint is actually wet. So be mindful of that. I want it to have that dark undertone to it because this is the base layer. And again, I'm going to do two levels of highlight on top of this and uh, really bring out that red. And then I'm going to dye it back down. That's right, I'm gonna tie it back down uh, as well. So take your time uh, on this portion right here. When it comes to Night Titans, the shoulder pads are something that people noticed straight away. Uh, they're gonna know uh, your shoulder pad and your carapace uh, are the two most prominent areas of a Night Titan. So you need to get those right even if you sort of fudge up here and there if you get these two areas right then you have a solid night titan so it pays to take the time to uh go over it several times in order to get it just right that transition just right now when it comes to the citadel paints i do have the dropper bottles i actually um take the paint, put it in a dropper bottle, and whatever doesn't get transferred into the dropper bottles, I leave it into the paint pot. Uh, so this way I have both until I use up everything that's inside the paint pot. And then, you know, I'll just go completely with the dropper bottle. But here's the thing with the paint pot that I realized. Uh, a lot of people complain about the paint pot because it dries on the top portion right uh, there, but you can actually take the top portion of the paint pots from Citadel off. You can, they, they pull pretty much right off and then you could just take them to the sink and clean them out and then put them back on and it creates a seal. Now it does waste a little bit of paint, which is annoying, but it's not devastating. And, and it used to be, I used to take the dry paint from the pot and try to like scrape it out and I had a hard time at it, but uh, washing it up and, and just ripping, <laughs> gently ripping the top portion off uh, of the paint pot does help tremendously. All right, so uh, right now I am doing that mid-tone red, uh, the first highlight, and trying to bring that up. Uh, and, you know, getting, oh no, wait a second, I am actually <laughs> hitting Caribbean Crimson, actually. This is Citadel Shade, and I'm going around the edges of it. Now, nothing does transition the Caribbean Crimson on red. Like really, if you want recessed shadows, Curb and Crimson does an amazing job to give depth to uh, the red. So I love, 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 love using that <laughs> on the edges of the panel, sort of like reverse panel modulation, uh, where you're trying to be the highlight in the middle of the plate and then the edges are darker, but now I'm actually putting in the shadows around the edges using the uh, Citadel shade, which is uh, it's a pretty neat process. You can see that right there, that's wet. And wait until that dries, it's become so subtle. And I'll put that in the background right there so you can see that. Now, this process of painting a night titan for 24 hours, I have to say it was, it was a challenge. It was pretty grueling, uh, but in the end, I actually surprised myself. So, and it was, it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, and I was always nervous about painting night titans. And it was, it was, it was an un needed fear these things are actually a lot of fun because they are large and you could do so much more with them uh as far as transitions and it's just so much more forgiving 
Now, if the shoulder pad was of a mini marine and you try to do this kind of transition on it and if you just hit the wrong area just a little bit it's gonna look absolutely atrocious but with this I'm actually you know going far back well pretty far back right there while I'm airbrushing and it, it looks tremendous look at look at that fade oh my goodness and it's because I have so much room to work with that I can actually do that transition okay time for the reveal uh, you do want to take off the tape while uh, the previous layer is wet I learned that if you let it dry on there some bleeding might occur and that's when the paint actually goes to the other side of the the area in which you don't want color into it like say the red would bleed over to the white uh, but you know since I took it off while it was wet it just does a phenomenal job uh, at peeling off and look at that transition I am I am super proud of that transition I am super happy super happy with that all right uh, time for the mask let's see if I have any bleeding there as well and if you do get bleeding you can always go back and repeat the process uh, it is not catastrophic uh, Really, really proud of that. All right, so time for that very large uh, carapace uh, for the, the the top right there. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go for a metallic, but not like the exoskeleton where I just did steel. I'm going to do steel, and then I'm going to do panel modulation with Vallejo metal color. So this steel, I want it to be dark, so I'm going to add some black ink to the paint. Adding the black ink to the paint actually gives it more depth, and it's going to become like a black steel. And you're going to see that right there. It's going to be a really, really super dark steel. Um, Again, I really encourage you to experiment with a lot of different metallics, uh, but I have found, oh wow, look at that dark steel. I have found that Vallejo metal color is my favorite. <laughs> I think that the metal flakes in there are just so realistic. And the most realistic when it comes to acrylic paint that I can actually add, see that ink to, and it takes it really well to get dark steel and stuff like that. There are other metallics which are better but they're alcohol based and they're kind of tricky to work with because they're alcohol based they're pretty thin that means the metal flakes within them they kind of fall to the bottom rapidly so you have to work really quickly with them in order to get that really great metallic uh, feel to it but with a uh, Vallejo metal color it since it is acrylic paint it's it just so workable look at that dark steel <laughs> All right, so I'm going to let that dry, and now that it is dry, I'm going to come back and I'm using chrome from Vallejo Metal Color, but you can use like uh, aluminum or pale, bur pale burnt metal or anything like, you know, a light tone to it. Uh, and I, I've had a little bit of trouble getting that uh, chrome to work with it, see? <laughs> and when it's like that, you know, I'm going to have to dilute that, you know, I'm trying to, there's so many different things that can uh, impede or block the uh, paint flow from the airbrush and usually it's because it's not diluted enough you really need to dilute it a bit more so i'm going to put some water in there uh through droplets and i'm going to try to get it flowing okay uh i could have used some flow improver right here but it wasn't part of the process right there um anything that kind of gets it quickly going is what i was going for right there so i was just like trying to think on the fly and believe me when i paint i make a ton of mistakes you know you're not alone out there if you make mistakes while you paint in fact that's part of the process so now i'm going to add those chrome bits doing panel modulation the reverse that i what i've done with the red paint on the shoulder pads i am going to uh put that dark steel in first right and then i'm going to hit the middle of each one of these panels with an aluminum or a chrome some bright steel so this way the edge of the panel looks dark while the center of the panel looks bright and it just really does an amazing job at it i think i nailed this carapace i think it was pretty cool and it looks pretty uh, metallic like it does i mean that's an understatement but it looks like metal instead of plastic now this is a plastic piece but if it actually gives off the the feeling of actual metal then you know that is a score 
uh, you know, when you're painting these things, it's, you know, selling an illusion, right? So you're selling the illusion that this is steel and this is a miniature of an actual real thing. It's not a plastic, it's not a toy, it's not, a, it's just a real representation of something that is real that looks as if it were the real thing, but shrunken down. And that's the idea behind painting miniatures. So if you can fool the eye into believing that this is actually steel, then that is a win in my book right there. <laughs> Now there's a window in there. I could have gone and painted the window separately, but guess what? I'm saving some time here. Uh, just another step. Looks pretty good. It doesn't have to be painted to tell a story. So there's that. All right, there they are. I'm so happy about those things. They look so great. Uh, all right, so now I have to do the same thing here to the leg. I'm going to put some red paint on one of the armor panels for the leg and repeat the process that I did before. It's already masked off, so that's definitely a step in the right direction. And I am just going to add some flow improver this time and make sure that everything is flowing within the airbrush. I usually put a drop or two in there before I add some water into the mix, uh, three or four drops of water water and then go from there like if I need to add some more water I will because um, I really can't give you an exact formula because different paints have different kind of you know a viscosity so you know the different colors has different kind of and you have to really play around with the color that you're using and see if you have to dilute it a little more or less now I am doing some backflow here to mix it within the cup sort of what I do maybe I'm doing that wrong but that's what I've always done and you know I mix it right within the cup itself i learned from other uh youtubers that do the same thing and it's not really an issue with them so that's what i do all right so going to paint this red uh and it was silver so it's going from silver it's not a white to red transition i believe that was a silver or um, a metallic uh steel color over to red <laughs> instead of white and red I, I believe that's exactly what i did um again using the process all the armor panels is where the shine Rem remember the exoskeleton from the beginning of this right so the exoskeleton in the beginning of this is still drying <laughs> and will be drying for quite some time also i wanted to say that the 24 hours that i did um it was 24 hour paint time so as i'm painting i started a counter and then as i stopped i paused the counter so it was 24 hours paint time uh not one shot i didn't uh do the red eye or anything like that so i just wanted uh, total transparency here uh <laughs> But still, I am amazed that I got all this work done in such a short amount of time, being that my first Night Titan took me six months. Now just doing it in 24 hours is an absolute amazing accomplishment for, for me. And I'm super excited. And I, you know, I really do challenge you, try to get a Night Titan done in 24 hours and push yourself like that and see and what, if you get through to the other end, when you get through to the other end, it's an amazing transformation for you. It's an amazing accomplishment that you can do. And you feel so much more confident with getting more things done, right? If you wanna work on your confidence, and I, I firmly believe that part of your painting skill is your confidence in painting. You need to paint boldly, you need to paint confidently, and in order to be able to paint confidently, you have to be able to challenge yourself and see that, you know what, no matter what, I'm gonna come through the other end, and if you do that, when you come out the other end, you actually come out a better painter. And you continue pushing yourself in this aspect, and you'll always come out a better painter, and you just keep improving that way. If you stick to a formula, right? If you stick to the same formula time and time again, even if you're painting an army and you do absolutely nothing different, well, then if you're doing nothing different, then you're not growing as a painter. You're, you're not pushing yourself uh, uh, certain directions. You're not uh, learning new techniques. You're just doing the same thing over and over again, which is fine if all you want to do is get your army on the table and you're like, uh, I just have to put the color minimum. I don't care about you know painting so much. I just want to get the color minimum, uh, three colors and a base, and, and it's on the table and I get to play with my miniatures and that's all, that's all I care about. And that's completely valid. 
You know, some people just want to just get their miniatures on the table. I have friends that do that, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong. You know, uh, but at the same time, if you do want to push yourself and get, become a better painter, you're going to have to push yourself out of your comfort zone of doing the things that you know work and try doing something different. For example, uh, going from painting blue space wolves to painting these red was definitely a push in a different uh, direction. Now you can change and push yourself in a different direction using a different color, like I just mentioned. Uh, you could change uh, and push yourself a different direction by using a different product. So if you have a different product, like, you know, some basing paste or something like that, you never tried it before, uh, or some gel medium, and you know, you try that before, or a modeling paste or something like that, and you wanna use it for something like lava or, you know, whatever, you know, and you wanna try something you've never done before. It's really important with every miniature, you try something you've never done before, even if it's small, it's still improving you as a painter. All right, so there it is. Um, that armor panels. Armor panels are so important on a Night Titan. It's like the exoskeletons over there drying, and it, there wasn't much to it. Now, you can put a lot of detail into it, but it, a lot of it's going to get covered. What people really notice on a Night Titan are the armor panels. So that's where you really want to focus most of your attention on, uh, really nailing those on. Uh, uh, armor panels all the way throughout uh, and it'll really it'll really show through across the table it will show uh, through when you put it up close like it like it just makes this type of miniature and that's what I, one of the things I do love about night Titans is that I only really have to worry about the armor panels you know uh, every now and again, you take a wire or something like that and paint it yellow or paint it a, like a contrasty color so you, it looks, it gives it depth and stuff like that. But people really don't notice it. Like, <laughs> you have to be staring at it for, for a bit, you know, because when you have these red armor panels and white armor panels popping in your face, they kind of take the center stage when you're looking at the miniature and you really don't pay attention to the stuff that's, you know, the underpinnings and stuff like that unless you're looking at it for quite some time. Uh, another thing you can do to improve as a painter is to take like someone's really stunning work and then stare at it for a good five minutes without looking away, without looking at your phone, without looking at anything else but looking at the miniature and really start dissecting what it is about that miniature that makes it so stunning. Okay, so it was a white to um, the red transition on this leg right there. <laughs> okay, all right, so uh, time for some gold. All right, so in order to do some gold here, I wanna, uh, if you use Vallejo metal color, this is like a greenish or cold gold or a greenish gold, and they do really don't have, they don't have any other uh, variation of gold. Vallejo, if you're listening right now, model color, have different kinds of like a rose gold and a, and a cool gold, and well, this is a green gold. And what I'm gonna do is here is I'm gonna add some ink to it. I'm adding some uh, sepia ink to it right there. Really trying to warm it up. Also, I'm gonna add some water to this mixture. I'm using the reverse side of a bottle cap. Go recycling. And I'm using one happy brush. I do have a link in the description to the one happy brush. These are disposable brushes because when you are painting with metallic paint, you are going to ruin your brush. There's metal flakes in there, so do not use your Raphael's or, or your really nice brushes or, or your Winsor & Newtons in order to um, paint with metallic paint. You want to use a cheaper brush, and I do like One Happy brushes because they come in packs of 50, and if they get destroyed, so what? I'll just pop another one in there. Now I'm doing the knee pad right here in gold. I'm gonna go around right here. Notice that I'm using my pinky to brace my hand. When you limit the motion of your hand, you gain control of your brush strokes. So if you need to work on your brush control, always brace your hand against something. Now I'm using a pill bottle and I'm using my pinky uh, to stabilize my hand because my hands do shake when I paint. So if I wanna do fine details, and especially with this hobby where you are painting fine details, uh, you gotta to want to brace your hand, limit your motion, and up your control. Uh, and, and I do encourage you to try that. So if this is the one thing you do or learn while doing a process of a Night Titan uh, within 24 hours, because yeah, I know you're doing it too, right? <laughs> if not, well, I'm really happy that you are joining me. Maybe whip out a model and start painting along <laughs> while, I, uh, while I go on and, 
and talk about my painting process right here. I always like to have something in the background when I'm painting, whether it's an audiobook, uh, whether it's another YouTuber on in the background, uh, or a podcast. Uh, and some people ask me what podcasts I listen to. Uh, I listen to This American Life uh, with Ira Glass. Uh, it's a great, I mean, really great series. In fact, I got the app so I can listen to all the shows starting from the 90s all the way up to today, which is still putting out shows once a week. Uh, Chicago Public Radio. I really encourage you to uh, check that out. It's really cool. It's really cool. There's, there's a lot of stuff. All right. Uh, that's the, that I'm reading... Um, for audiobooks, I am actually going through the Inheritance series, so starting with Aragon, and now I'm actually on the last book, Inheritance. So I did, um, the, the books are 30 hours of read time, about 30 hours of read time, so 369, <laughs> what is it, uh, uh, what, I'm about 100 hours at least, 120 hours. About 120 hours into the story, <laughs> that's a lot of painting. That's a lot of painting. So anyway, um, and the reason why I'm leading the Inheritance or listening to the Inheritance series is because of one of my students who actually had Aragon and was reading it and was like, uh, you know, I'm going to read this. And it was before Corona actually, you know, hit and affected us all. And, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to read these Ar the, the Aragon series, the Inheritance series, it's called. And I I'll have something to, you know, discuss with her um about you know reading and literacy and i thought it'd be kind of cool so but i didn't know what i was getting myself into and how long these audiobooks are actually uh and it's it's pretty cool there's a lot more politics in it than i thought for a book so i think it's actually really cool and i uh, recommend that you read it if you do have an army to paint and you have countless hours to to invest into this hobby it kind of locks you in and it makes you feel like you're getting something else accomplished other than just, you know, painting. Not that it's just painting. I don't want to minimize the value of painting, but still, uh, you get more accomplished. So here is my gold. Pretty cool. Some of you may have noticed by now that this Night Titan kind of looks like the Canis Rex kit. And you wouldn't be completely wrong here because what I did was is that I had a Night Titan box and I bought uh, the Canis Rex uh, sprue on eBay and I just converted it and made it my own. Uh, I didn't have all the decals that came with it. so. Any of the chains and stuff like that, I figured it was time for some freehand. So I added that to the mix and I took some of the Space Wolves Regalia because uh, their decals have wolves on it. Canis Rex has wolves on it. I mean, you know I love my wolves, so there you go. All right, back to Table Town. Won't you take me to a freehand town? That's right, we're back to freehanding this uh, piece right here and I did not have the decals that came with the Canis Rex kit I don't know if there is a decal sheet that comes with a Canis Rex kit but I uh, assume and you know what happens when that happens uh, that it's going to be you know some chains that go over here I saw some pictures and I figured I want some uh, unbroken chain because he's the unbroken I, I want to be a thematic there so whenever I'm doing freehand I usually draw it out on a piece of paper but this time I feel comfortable and confident uh, to be able to just draw some chains on the onto this carapace uh, not a carapace, I'm sorry, the shoulder pad. And um, what allows me this kind of uh, comfort is because I did use a gloss varnish on this. And um, gloss varnish is pretty, you know, it's very protected. In fact, out of all the varnishes, you have your satin and then you have your uh, matte. You can even go all the way uh, ultra matte, whatever. Um, but out of all of them, gloss varnish, uh, I find, is the toughest. So it, it'll handle a lot of abuse, like, you know, this mechanical pencil, uh, ultra hard uh, mechanical pencil, that I'm going to yeah, just draw straight onto the, uh, the painted piece, and none of the paint is getting pulled up, and that's great. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, Going for chains is out or any kind of design that is just like, um, I guess, you know, when you don't have a set 
perfect aligned pattern since it's only just one shoulder pad and it's not like I'm doing the exact same pattern on the opposite side, then I have the liberty to, you know, make it not that even. And, and you know, the thing about your eyes, you know, your mind, right? Uh, if it, it likes to see patterns and things, you know, it likes to make associations via patterns. Um, I'm in the game of teaching, so to speak, and I realize that people want to make patterns things. When I'm teaching language, right, uh, you want to take the knowledge base that you know uh, about a language uh, and apply it to a different language. For example, um, you have cafe, and you're using your English knowledge to know that that's coffee, right? For you know, so you're using your your cognates, you're using your prior knowledge in order to make associations. Your brain does love doing that. Where does that leave with miniature painting? Great question. All right, so when you draw something that has lines or a pattern in it that's set, and you try to draw exactly the same thing on the opposite side, we as human, great band by the way, we as human. Uh, we want to see symmetry. We want to see perfection in lines. And our, our eyes are trained to see asymmetrical things and say, hey, something is wrong. It's not perfectly patterned, right? So um, <laughs> you take those things, human error, and uh, your mind's ability to want to make things symmetrical, and you try to do the exact same pattern on one shoulder pad to the next shoulder pad, it's like really difficult to do that, right? So since I'm only doing it on one shoulder pad, I have the liberty to draw it any way I want to draw it, and it's fine, you know? It's not, I don't have to worry about uh, each link being in the perfect place. All I do have to worry about is each link filling up the area appropriately and making sure uh, since he's the uh, unbroken or the chain breaker um, that one of these links are indeed broken uh, <laughs> and this was a lot of fun like when it comes to freehand this was about so like so stress-free this was ultra stress-free and as I'm doing these miniatures, I'm actually getting better at my freehand. Now, we call it freehand, people call it sketching, you know, regular artists, or not regular, but, you know, uh, your run-of-the-mill artist calls it sketching. Uh, our freehand with paintbrush, uh, people just call it painting, you know, because you have a canvas, there's nothing on the canvas, you have to do it freehand, you know. So, <laughs> there's that as well. Alright, so... You can use your paintbrush if you'd like to uh, fill that in, but uh, for me, when it comes to the paintbrush, I, I did not want to take a chance with this since it's a 24 hour build. I wanted to make it quick. I'm gonna go what works for me right now, which is uh, these Micron pens. And if you do not have a Micron pen, I highly recommend that you get a Micron pen. And the reason why I love these things so much, especially uh, .005, um, the the uh, size of it is because you you can you can you can do eyes <laughs> you can you can do eyes you can do scroll work you can do some freehand with it if you if you are uh, okay at sketching say I don't think I'm I'm very talented uh, but you know I do like to doodle and you know I'm I do keep on trying to exercise that muscle. Uh, in order to draw. If, oh, I just got an idea. So if you want to get better at freehand, I highly recommend you go and you get yourself a book, um, a drawing, um, uh, I don't know, a sketchbook. There it is. You get yourself a sketchbook and uh, look at to the art and no matter how good or bad it comes out, just try to draw stuff. Like, uh, I'm practicing for uh, my Tau army, and I want to do a lot of freehand on it. I know how to do that. So I'm drawing a lot of anime, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to anime uh, some freehand onto uh, some flat panel areas of my Tau army, and that's something I really want to do. So I need to practice that, you know? So I'm sketching, I'm sketching. I I'll take and I'll just try to complete as many books as possible, sketchbooks like full sketchbooks. I try to complete as many sketchbooks as possible and use every inch of paper as possible to draw as much as possible. And the more you do that, 
the more you have muscle memory with your hands, you'll get like how to do anime eyes and to the point you do so many eyes, you could do it, you know, almost without looking. And if you could do it on the sketchbook that and it becomes like second nature to you, you'll be able to do it on a flat panel uh, real easy. And as you see there that I did over here, I sketched it out in pencil first and then all I did was trace over it. Like it's so easy, right? Um, <laughs> I know, so easy for you, Rob, because you've been practicing, right? So easy for you too, dear viewer, if you practice. And you see the chains coming out really nicely right there. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about decals. Some people call them decals, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's no wrong all right but let's talk a little bit about decals um i'm using uh logan grimnar's great company uh, i'm gonna dip it into water i left it in there for a bit and now i'm gonna apply it right there so i'm gonna apply it to this side over here so i'm using a tweezers that's angled it's really good it's a hobby tweezers right and what i'm going to do is i am taking a brush not my i'm taking a synthetic brush one happy choice again i'm going to slide it on so if you don't know how to do decals this is a good way to do it so you see that very simple very simple now it's still wet so you could push it into place just like nudge it here and nudge it there and you're gonna see me uh start nudging it um but if it is where you want it to be you're gonna want to take out any bubbles that are arising within uh the piece now you could leave it there but what i see tend to happen is sometimes it crinkles and sometimes it deforms especially when you're not on an even surface well if that is the case uh, they just start, you know, not really looking like it's conforming. And you really do want your decals to have a painted on look. I use Microsole and Microset. Microsole and Set softens up the decal. I use Sole first uh, to soften up the decal so this way it can conform to uh, any kind of like shape. So this is a round shape. Um, I didn't necessarily need to put the, the micro sole on this one, but I wanted to do for the purpose of this. Um, I really do want that painted on look. And, you know, you you know, use where, where you feel. Like, oh my gosh, I don't know, this decal is not sitting right. I'm a little bit worried about, you know, the conformity. I have an uneven surface. You know, all those things. <laughs> um, try um, micro scale, micro sole to soften up the decals. And then micro set to set it into place. So this way it, it supposedly gets rid of the shine of the decal and um, just, you know, really makes it. Um, I, I don't find that with micro set. I don't know. It's a little weird. Maybe I'm using it wrong. I don't know. I've been, I've been doing research. I've been watching blogs. I've been watching other YouTubers use this stuff and, you know, educating myself. Being an educator, I love to educate myself and learn new things. Uh, that's why I go onto YouTube and discover. But there it is. Now you're going to see it's bubbly, right? Uh, and that's what happens with Microsite. See, it just really makes the miniature bubble up and like, oh, really make it soft. So what we're going to do here is we're going to even it out. See, I'm literally painting on top of the um, the decal and I'm, I'm taking any air bubbles that are in there and I'm pushing it onto the edge and I'm getting rid of the air bubbles. And I constantly do that. Um, I do that with the paintbrush uh, to start with, especially when it's very wet. Um, do realize that at this point, your decal is soft. I mean, that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make the decal soft so it can conform to any edge. Uh, so it's possible that it might move around. So kind of be gentle with it, but get rid of all that, uh, those air bubbles. Now you can see, if it's still little crinkle lines in there, right? So you don't want to get rid of those uh, as well. You got to wait till it dries a little and stretch it out. That's what you're doing. You're stretching out the decal. And when you stretch out the decal, it actually conforms to the area. Now, here is a Q-tip. I'm going to accelerate the process of it drying. And I'm pushing uh, the Q-tip. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm pushing the Q-tip to the end of the decal. Uh, right there and uh, again stretching out the decal so it can just really cover over and look like it was actually painted on you want all your decals not to look like big old stickers onto your piece especially your miniature you want it to look realistic so you're going to want to look like somebody actually took the time to paint this on uh, q-tip 
decreases the humidity and stretches out that uh, decal. So you can see all those ridges and wrinkles are magically gone, uh, right? Um, using that Q-tip. And I, this is how I apply. I just don't apply and walk away. I apply and I aggressively go in there and look at that so smooth, although reflective. Now that, that we're gonna talk about that in just a bit. Um, all right, so here it is, Ultra Matte Varnish from AK Interactive. I'm gonna paint it on, but uh, to be honest with you, airbrush is the best way to go with this. Um, so sometimes it works with the painted on. Um, some people use frosted, um, I guess, liquid or paint, uh, frosted varnish. Uh, I, I've heard that works as well. And it just, just kills down that shine. That's what you want to do. Uh, also, there's another product. Uh, it's called Decal Fix. Uh, it's from Vallejo. You can use that as well uh, with varying degrees. I'm using ultra matte varnish on this one. Um, and it really does do the trick. Uh, and since most of the surfaces, surface eye, uh, are, <laughs> are matte in this uh, miniature, it just like blends in, you know? So it really does look like it was painted like everything else. And you need to be gentle with this, but just make sure you're covering all the edges. Uh, make sure that you're covering the entire miniature. You're not completely soaking it. Uh, being gentle, you see. So it's like painting with varnish, right? That should be like a, a different show. Hi, welcome to painting with varnish. No, no, that'll never be. <laughs> oh goodness but you see that line there and it looks shiny because it's wet right now you know when it dries it, it sort of dies uh, dies down and if it doesn't uh you go back there with an airbrush all right so here it is um after the matte varnish dries and it's varnished so it's protected looks the shine is just gone right uh and i'm gonna do the same here uh with the eagle as well See how I did that? I, I took the brush and I put it underneath the miniature just to move the whole entire thing. Uh, this eagle for uh, Light Titans uh, notoriously can get a little wonky on you. So just be careful and um, just like use the same techniques that I did for the wolf. Uh, you got to do over there uh, for the eagle uh, as well. You got to see that. Now, one thing I did notice that I did the red and the white uh, symmetrically. In other words, they're both facing forward. And uh, according to the Canis Rex, one of those, like the chained one, had to be fo facing forward while the other one, or the eagle, was supposed to be facing uh, towards the back. So, you know, I messed it up. Oh, well. <laughs> That's why it's. I didn't label it as Canis Rex video. It's a Night Titan in 24 hours because, you know, it's my take on it. And that's just the way it's going to be. Oh, well, got to go. Uh -huh. All right. So this eagle is pretty cool. Now, if you do not like this eagle or you want to make it your own or you want to do some blending on it or anything like that. Yes, I just said blending on your decals. You can. You could literally paint over your decals and that could be like your base you know how i trace out or i uh, wouldn't trace is a bad word you know how i sketch out my freehand on my model itself this could be your base sketch you can use that as your base sketch and then you can go on top of it and draw anything you want you know if you wanted to make a non-metallic metal eagle instead of a uh, white eagle you can paint your non-metallic metal on top of this this is like uh the guide you know this is like all right here's the bones let me make something out of the bones you know and you could definitely do that uh, with all your decals and they look amazing, right? Uh, I've heard a lot of people in painting competitions do that. You know, what do they say? Well, I had this decal. I wanted to make wings. I, they had to be symmetrical and you know, I'm not going to make symmetrical wings. And I'm like, what did you do? All right. So what I did was is uh, I took a decal and put the symmetrical and got it to the angle that I wanted to. And then just like painted my design over it because now the wings itself are actually symmetrical and I have a guide to make it look symmetrical and some of this the work is just absolutely stunning absolutely stunning all right going back with the q-tip again getting rid of the humidity pulling the decal uh stretching it over the surface really making it look phenomenal actually really good uh and i'm happy the way the shoulders came out i mean i am really happy the way the shoulders came out again 
panels, shoulder pads, carapace, all these things are what you see out of the night. And you can notice that the Night Titan is in the background and it has fully dry, dry, dry. Well, I don't know about fully, you know, I don't know. It might take like three or four days to get fully and we, didn't, we, we ain't got time for that, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I know the carapace is uh, pretty much done. So basically when you're you're planning out an eye titan, so do your exoskeleton, you know, do your oil washes and then just do all your panels and while your oil wash dries. I mean that works for me. Uh, so yeah, uh, it pays to be meticulous when it comes to your decals and you know get finicky with it. Right now, uh, gonna add the good old um, varnish to it. Yeah, AK Interactive, just pulling it out um, and just put it onto the side there and uh, just working it in, just working it in and really making it look great. Uh, speaking of which, that uh, mask I did, I am super proud of that. You know, I put that gold in between and it looked great, like really. And I like, you know, changing it, using the inks with the gold uh, really gives it definition and character. I wanted a warm gold and that's exactly how I got. That's how you could change a cold gold into a warm gold is just to add that brown tones or reddish tones into it. And, you know, if you add actual red ink to gold you're gonna get rose gold um, and that's a thing if you didn't know all right well here we go we have everything ready uh, for that um, for those sh uh, shoulder pads yeah there you go all right so time for the chest plate time for the chest plate um a full disclosure here i messed up on the chest plate yeah i started writing stuff and i wrote it upside down and it's so easy to do because you would think that the top part which is wider is the the, the top part onto the miniature but it's the opposite like the narrower part of the chest plate is goes to the top and the lower part goes to the bottom and you'll see exactly what i'm talking about and now the um <laughs> the bonehead thing that i did here was i did my free hand upside down oh well nobody's noticed it so far so <laughs> only those that are truly dedicated to the channel and that's watching uh an hour in uh will be able to know that the writing is upside down, but oh well, gotta go. All right, so I am trying uh, white from Creature Caster, uh, sent by a viewer, Mike McBroom, who um, sent me this paint for me to try out. He knows that notoriously I despise painting white. I just do, I, 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 I do not have a good time. It always comes out blotchy to me. I'm thinking it's the wrong formula, blah, blah, blah. I know it has to do with the chemical composition of uh, white paint and how they uh, no longer can use um, lead in order to cut that. So they use talcum powder and therefore your paint becomes really chalky and you know, ugh. It's just the way they had to do it because of regulations and safety concerns, and I get it. If they're using lead in the paint and you are a brush licker, that's no bueno, <laughs> not at all. Uh, so yeah, so he's, uh, Mike said, you need to try out this white from Creature Caster, and um, it's, it's revolutionary. And I'm like, okay, you know, I, I have heavy body acrylic whites, I have Vallejo model color white, I have Vallejo uh, game color dead white, I have, um, you know, I have, uh, I have like an umpteenth amount of white paint from different ranges, and I've never been happy with any of them. I'm gonna tell you right now, this stuff is good from Creature Caster. Yeah, this stuff is really good and um i like it i like it so you see i'm doing ivory on top of that white as a base so doing the base and now i'm going to do some ivory I, I tried the bone color you can do anything with this but i'm trying the white uh i'm using uh white ivory and bone and there it is pro acryl from creature caster the bomb.com now i'm going to mix that in uh just taking a little bit of bone trying to get that because it's really stark white and I, I want it to be a little aged so having a little bit of brown in your white makes it a little bit of like aged parchment and I know it can't really be parchment because it's on metal like that because that's kind of weird that it doesn't like fall off and disintegrate it is a night titan like huge metal war machine so any kind of paper on it will kind of disintegrate after a while I mean that goes with the purity seals too but that's just like you know 
It's pure as he seals. You've done everything to earn all this and you get a badge of honor and it disintegrates on you very shortly afterwards because that's how much your accomplishments actually meant in the 41st millennia. <laughs> Not valued at all. Um, <clears throat> So now, uh, going in with that bone, and you just see, I am not putting my finger or hand or resting my hand on the, the pill bottle this time, but I am grabbing the pill bottle, my left hand for dear life, and I'm resting my wrist onto the table, and then I'm resting my hand on my other hand. That's another way to brace. Look at that hand. Uh, Look at the restriction that I'm putting onto my hand, which is increasing the control. But you're gonna need control on this one because the tendrils of these things, the, the, the very ends of these things, um, they're small. <laughs> So, I mean, that's an understatement. So you have to be, you know, have a really steady hand. And this is how you steady your hand, you know? Uh, a lot of different ways. I like showing the way I control my brush strokes with my hand. Uh, so this way you can, you know, model that and gain better brush control. A lot of, a lot of painters uh, can, that watch my channel tell me, well, Rob, you know, I don't have any brush control. And I'm like, okay, you know, I didn't either. My hand shakes, you know, so I have to stabilize my hand. Stabilize your hands, ladies and gentlemen. Stabilize your hands. And you're like, well, how do I stabilize my hand? Look at my hand positions right there, you know. Restricting your motion is the best way to stabilize your hand and lead towards brush control. So there it is right there. So that's the discipline. And the more you do it, the better you get. And in fact, it becomes second nature. You need these techniques to become second nature in order to be uh, to, to expand to the next level, right? So we're all on a journey for painting, right? And you want to get to the next level. And the only way you're going to get to the next level is you try something that is really difficult for you and it's really difficult for you and it takes you a very, very long time. Time. And then when you, you finish, you're like, yeah, I did it. But at that point, you can't say to yourself, okay, I'll never do it again. I did it once. It's done. It's under my belt. I never have to do it again. No. It's like painting infantry. So you did it the first time and you painted one figure. Well, whoop dee, that's great that you did it the first time. But if you're painting infantry, right, by the end of your, I don't know, uh, assign a number there, right, of your infantry, <laughs> like it could be from five to uh, 120 or something if you're playing orcs, right? By the end of that unit, it, it'll start, you know, the habits that you use, the techniques that you use will start becoming second nature because you're doing it over and over and over and over again. And you don't even have to think about it anymore. Uh, the techniques that you're using, uh, especially if you like to say you did really some, something really difficult on that first infantry unit. Well, those techniques, if you keep using them on all the infantry units by the end of the project, when you finish all the infantry, you're going to be really good at that thing that you found difficult before and here's the thing okay you will get quicker at it you will do it as if it was second nature now you've mastered that ability now what you need to do is like for the next project try something else that's really difficult and takes a very long time and then do it multiple times until it becomes second nature that's how you grow in this hobby and in, in that's how you grow in anything really, uh, in, in, in playing music uh, and anything else, like if you keep on practicing, like obsessively practicing, you will get better at it, you know, no matter what it is. Um, there's a lot of people that are, are really good with, you know, making coffee, for example, right? Because they make coffee for their entire family every single day. And they make several cups of that at a time and they get the, the milk just right, they froth it, you know? If you're a frother, uh, they froth it and they, they do a whole bunch of stuff, you know, to it. And uh, <laughs> they get really good at it. Same thing with miniature uh, painting or anything, really. Keep practicing. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm taking some bone white and I'm getting the edges of this tabard. All right, and I'm going to get the backside of the tabard as well. Now, the, the center of it, the wolf itself, it, it will be painted white. Uh, and I did paint it white, stark white, because that's, you know, the theme of Camus Rex. So I did that as well. So now what I did was I need to paint the opposite side. So it's like, how am I going to do that? Well, here it is. <laughs> I am taking off all the poster tack right there, this pill bottle. 
and I'm going to try to put it uh, in a way that it does mess. So I'm going to put it right on the white section of the uh, Canis Rex model because I know that it's painted. And I'm going to do the opposite side. I'm going from black. Uh, and you get to see I'm doing bone. So I'm slowly going to bring it up. It's going to be more than one pass. You know, it's not once and done. Uh, so I'm going over it, slowly bringing it up, going back, hitting the air. Uh, sometimes you apply paint when you're through the airbrush. Sometimes you just apply the air so you can dry the area and then hit it with another uh, layer. Uh, and that's what I have to do. Uh, this is over black and there's bone white and uh, looking pretty darn good there. <laughs> pretty happy how quickly that kind of came out there. Um, yeah, pretty awesome. <laughs> All right, some Seraphon Sepia after I wait for it to dry. I want to age it, so I'm just going to hit uh, a little bit of the burnish stuff. Uh, getting that Serapon Sepia. Notice that I'm doing uh, multiple passes. Uh, and I'm going to do some streaking there. Uh, just doing a line straight across diagonal right there. Uh, so this way it goes from brown to a lighter to a brown again. Uh, I just mess around with stuff like that. Right now I'm just playing with paint. See that? Oh, that was just so quick in like five minutes and I just gave it dimension. You know, it has depth now. You know, pretty cool. Pretty cool. And I'm gonna have to get to the other side as well and doing some of that, but uh, I don't know. See how quickly this dries? Boom. All right, so while you're putting it on, there's the bone color, uh, giving it some dimension, giving it uh, some depth by adding some brown to it. All right there, and it couldn't be easier to do that, you know? Everybody just paints it, like, if they go to paint a tabard, they paint it white, and then they take your wash, and they're just gonna slop it on there. Uh, that's okay, but, I mean, with an airbrush, you can just do so much more. <laughs> Look at that. That looks pretty, pretty cool, right? And you always want to do that. You always want to give visual interest to your models, because if not, they get boring, right? If it's not interesting, it's the antithesis of interesting, which is boring, right? So you don't want to do that. You don't want to stagnate your model. You want to give people more and more stuff to look at. So, yeah. And with this stuff, if you push it too far, you can always paint right over it and begin the process again. But I think that came out pretty well. I'm very happy with that. All right. So I painted the red in the middle, and I'm just going to touch up the white in the center right there so yeah i painted the red and i used mephiston red uh that's what i'm gonna use the same theme throughout the army you want to limit your color palette so if you're going to use red use the same uh, red techniques even if you're stepping it up three levels use the same technique throughout the entire model to create unity that makes sense right so if you're using uh red blue and orange stay within the family of the red blue and orange that you use throughout the entire build the entire project this way it makes the entire project unified you know uh and it looks like it belongs you know and you want to do that you want to you want to have relationships with colors within your miniature right there are certain colors that you put together that are repulsive and there are certain colors that you put together that are harmonious, that they, you know, they're pleasing to the eyes, you know. So what you want to do, if you want to have repulsive colors uh, in your color palette, it's called uh, contrasting colors, right? Uh, which is opposite under the spectrum of the color wheel. That means they repulse each other or they're the opposite uh, colors. But oddly enough, like uh, when you want to have contrast, you go from like black to all the way to a white which are like opposite sides of the, the spectrum there that adds the contrast when you're doing uh, a miniature you want to think in the concept of having those polarizing colors and you know blending from one color all the way into the next like opposing color or contrasting color and it really creates a dynamic uh visually striking um miniature because you're actually um you're actually having that ultra high contrast within there. Um, so, I mean, I, I really play around with that. I play around with colors, uh, read about color theory. It's really important that you understand how colors work and most importantly, how your brain perceives color, you know? <clears throat> so you're trying to, you're trying to deceive other people's eyes, which are paint. This is essentially what you're doing. You're creating illusions with your paint. Uh, these aren't real. That's not really a tabard, but it looks like a tabard. This is not really a shield. It's a plastic little 
you know, toy <laughs> shield, and uh, but we're trying to make it look realistic, right? So what you're trying to do is deceive the eyes. So learning having a plan of attack is definitely the way to go. Now. I'm treading on uh, pretty uh, light ground here because I did not varnish this before I wrote on it. Um, if you go over just with a little bit of gloss varnish, it'll help you. So I'm just gonna be super gentle. And what I'm doing is I'm writing out Canis Rex, right? So what I'm doing is the R for the Canis Rex, right? And then on the opposite side, I'm doing the X, right? So whenever you're writing something out and you want it to fill up an area, you're going to like kitty corner, do the first letter of it, and then do the last letter of it. So this way it'll fit within the area. Interesting, huh? And then you work your way towards the middle, right? With all the letters that fit into the thing. And you know, it's such a better process than just writing the thing straight out. Because sometimes I found that I'm trying to do freehand, I'm just writing the thing straight out. Sometimes I, I'm too short or you know i'm not i don't have to give myself or allow myself enough room when writing and it just does not look right so kitty quartering whenever you're writing a phrase or something on 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 a miniature is the way to go all right great technique to take home with you with this one uh again thank you for watching uh hour and 10 minutes in um <laughs> of this video in order to get like this little gem <laughs> that i'm just bopping on here um yeah, well, hopefully you're working on your miniature while I'm working on mine. Uh, I didn't really want to speed things up here. Uh, it was a 24 hour uh, process. It was a little bit grueling and I want to show you the process in real time. You know, I think that's fair to you to see uh, the process. Now I'm going back with my Micron pen, so precise. And what I'm doing is tracing over the sketch that I already did with my pencil, right? Couldn't be easier if you can trace this process is easy. Now I did Canis Rex and I didn't really look at the picture. Uh, it's supposed to be Canis on the top and Rex on the bottom, but I did the whole thing on top, right? Oh my goodness. So what am I going to do, right? What am I going to do with that bottom little piece? Well, I do what I usually do. I try to sneak in a TMP. My, uh, my, well, obviously, uh, the channel's uh, moniker, right? I try to uh, put that in. Look at how that came out. Canis Rex looks great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a TMP on the bottom, uh, right there. <laughs> and I didn't pencil it. I'm just freehanding it right now. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> I put TMP in there. Not a lot of people know that uh, about my miniatures. I, I try to sneak in a TMP in, in uh, at least once in my squad or unit of anything that I do. Uh, you have to look really close with it. Alrighty, so now uh, what I'm going to do is just gonna have the gold again. that um, The gold with the ink in it. And... Um, I'm going to start painting the eagles on the tabard itself. Now, with my last Night Titan, I did not uh, do the tabard that went out in the middle of the legs, only because I did it for competition. And what I wanted to do was that a wolf was taking out a thousand suns uh, and have that play out on the base uh, while I have this... Um, Night Titan on the top, and they say there's no wolves on Fenris, and I thought that was like, you know, ironic that a wolf is taking out a thousand sun, while, you know, the Night Titan is just completely oblivious because he doesn't have to pay attention to the thousand sun. It's just so, you know, the wolf got this, so. <laughs> I made that diorama, but if I couldn't make that, I could not make that diorama if I had the tabard in the middle, so I did not use a tabard in the middle for that night titan. But I am, this is the first time uh, actually fully painting a tabard in the middle, and I gotta tell you, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun painting his tabard. I like that uh, it already had like embossed the Canis Rex uh, symbol in there, uh, so it made it a lot easier, and it doesn't have to be like it's three dimensional, so it doesn't have to like. I didn't have to go to Pop Goes the Monkey, and if you've not tried Pop Go the Monkey, check out Pop Goes the Monkey. I'm gonna tell you right now, uh, a lot of great bits for you um, to add uh, to your army, and um, you'll curse me because you'll buy a whole bunch of stuff, but you'll also thank me if you check that out. Uh, they don't sponsor me or anything like that. It's just a really good site, and I don't care if something sponsors me or not sponsors me. Uh, they can if they want to. If it's something that's good, I'm gonna tell you guys, you know, and girls. I'm just gonna share it with you. All right, wow. Well, uh, gold bits for the wolves on the side. Good stuff right there. 
Um, scroll work and tabardry is, in, is infinitively interesting because it adds so much to your miniature. Now, uh, ironically, this miniature actually comes with another miniature, the actual pilot. And that one, since it's uh, painting at night time in 24 hour and not necessarily his writer, I did not do. <laughs> I did not want one of these days I'm going to do the writer because when you're playing it on the tabletop and Canis Rex explodes or you know uh, ceases to exist the writer actually pops out and then he's just like fighting with the writer now although if you're next to somebody who just took down a night titan they're probably going to devastate whatever pops out of your night your your driver your knight uh probably going to devastate that so be careful with that Alrighty, so uh, I'm going to do the chains here. I'm going with some steel. Just going in there and painting up the steel bits right there. Very simple to do. Uh, you can highlight them. But when it comes to Vallejo metal color, it's pretty much, you know, sorcery in a bottle. <laughs> you paint it and it looks metal. Uh, <laughs> I love this stuff. Um, can't, can't give it can't give it any more praise than it has because, you know, and I'll never stop praising it because... If it comes to acrylic paint, there is only one metal color, and that is Vallejo metal color. Now, uh, people say Scale 75 stuff is good, and I have not tried it, so I can't knock it right now. But out of all the metallic flakes and stuff like that that I've ever applied, this one actually looks so metallic when I put it on. And there's just so much more in the bottle that it just takes the, takes the crown here. Uh, <laughs> When it comes to acrylic paints, uh, metallic acrylic paints, can't say any more um, praise about it than I am right now because it's it is amazing. It's amazing. Uh, check out Vallejo Metal Color. I do have links in the description down below. Uh, there are Amazon affiliate links. If you do click on it, the channel does get a kickback um, at zero cost to you. Doesn't cost you a penny. If you want to support the channel, if not, I mean it's really cool that you know it's. Uh, yeah, you're an hour and 15 minutes in, and you're still watching. It's just amazing. Amazing! Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, a lot of the metal... A lot of the metal I, I for this project, I use a lot of inks for. Um, because I wanted to shade it darker, or, you know, have it lighter. And you can do that. That's the amazing thing about Vallejo Model Color, is you can use those inks in there. And really just change the property and the color of the... Um, change the property and the color of the uh, the metallic paint, which is pretty amazing, which you can do with your regular paints. All right, so uh, I painted the entire thing gold, Vallejo metal color. I did not put that on camera, um, lost footage. Now what I'm doing is I'm using uh, Troll uh, P3, Troll Blood Hide, and I'm just getting that nice uh, light bluish turquoise color I, I really do like that. So I like the color. It seemed nice. You don't have to use that paint particularly. You can use any paint or whatever you want to. If you're painting this particular Night Titan, um, you can use any of that. Um, and all the colors that I use are just a suggestion. Literally, I have two paint, three paint racks, and I just pull some stuff off, you know, and I use it until the bottle's empty, and then I go back to the paint rack and I pull something that's similar color and put that on my table until that's used up. Like I don't even care. I'll just like throw it out there. Now, if there's a paint that starts, you know. Um, uh, not performing the way it should I let you guys and girls know that you should avoid that but um, aside from that all the paints that I've been using aside from Minotaur which gunked up on me my Space Wolves Blue uh, gunked up on me which is weird in my opinion but I guess they have a shelf life right um, for Minotaur and if that's the case I mean I need I have a lot of Minotaur paints that I need to use up. I usually use Minotaur paint when it comes to uh, terrain and stuff like that because I kind of just want to use it up and I know that I'm going to like blast through a lot of that stuff. So like I'm like, Unker, Unker. <laughs> you know, uh, I just fly through it. Wow. Uh, so this is part of Hobby and Shelter. I, I had a lot of COVID projects um, that I got accomplished this uh, season, I guess, this um, plague season. 
<laughs> I guess, right? So um, I, I did a lot of hobby. I painted an entire terrain table. Uh, I, I painted an entire uh, Age of Sigmar Flesh Eater Quartz army. Uh, I painted up this Night Titan. I painted up uh, uh, mostly all my Space Wolves specific stuff um, that I wanted to get to. Any of the Mini Marine stuff that I had at that size. Uh, I wanted to get that all done so this way I could just work on Primaris and never look back again. Uh, my friend actually gave me Lucas the Trickster and a uh, banner holder, um, I guess a wolf banner holder for the Space Wolves. And just when I thought I was done, I got a wolf in to do and I'd be done with the project, they pulled me back in with some more mini marines. <laughs> but that's just two projects, you know, uh, and then I'll be done and that's it. And then uh, it's just all Primaris all the time. Plus, I have a special announcement for the uh, channel as well. Uh, I am going to do... I have some Horus Heresy uh, Betrayal of Kalth miniatures, which I'm going to do a project and paint them up in different uh, styles. You know, I'm going to have a little project there. Paint them up in different styles and stuff like that because uh, when it comes to Primaris, I have a lot of Primaris. In fact, I have like uh, infantry choices that even if I painted them up for my Space Wolves, there are so many of them, I'll never really feel them. So it doesn't make sense for me to have so many of them. So I have to have an overflow chapter, so I'm trying to decide which chapter that's going to be. All right, so time for a wash. Uh, and I did Dragonoff Nightshade uh, in between those areas right there, I believe. Yeah, Dragonoff Nightshade. Uh, just to get into the between areas right there and really just uh, I'm gonna have to go back and really make it pop later on uh, Here's where I'm using it as a real straight-up wash uh, And it does a good job. It really does what you know, it says on the tin <laughs> and I do like dragging off nightshade for uh, doing come like plasma coils and stuff like that uh, Does what it says very happy with it and I uh, see I'm just like dabbing it on there so yeah, you gotta watch out because it, it will get um, it will get splotchy on you. Like it'll cover some areas and not other areas. So uh, I put on multiple layers of it, I'm really trying to darken it up. But I do want to retain uh, that turquoise. Admittedly, see, so yeah, I'm really popping it on. Uh, I do want to retain the turquoise, but at the same time, you really do have to add a lot of it onto it so you can really get the recesses uh, like sure. Uh, you don't want it to pull up anywhere, so you're going to have to constantly go back and forth and make sure that everything is, you know, a subtractive method where if it pulls up, you're going to wipe off your brush and then take away the excess. But there it is. It looks pretty good uh, right there. All right. So um, I'm going to do some edge highlighting now. I'm going to wait for it to dry. And I'm using that FW blue ink right there. And I'm just using the edge of the brush and not the tip of the brush. And I'm just going to get the edges. And it's very important that you let the um, let the wash dry. And wash a wash takes a little longer to dry uh, than uh, regular paint. So be conscious of that, and you're going to want to make sure that it dries completely before you move on. Uh, I like using inks when it comes to doing edge highlighting. I just love the way it flows. I love the way inks flow. Uh, love using that. If you have not tried to use ink, um, absolutely amazing. It, it is a bit of a game changer, so be cognizant of uh, the inks. I like FW, but you can use a lot. Vallejo has an excellent forgiving line of ink, uh, but when you want to add like light blue like this, I mean, that, that dollar and rowney uh fw ink is great uh there are other ones uh, as well liquitex puts out some inks i hear they're really good too uh check them out you know and try them out and see what works for you that that is the most important thing you need to find out what works for you and employ that right i can't tell you what's going to work for you i can only tell you what works for me uh and that's just a single perspective you know this is just one perspective of a multifaceted uh a thing, our hobby, right? Um, I learned by taking uh, art class in college. Uh, it was intro to, I think, sketching or art or something like that. It was just an intro course. Um, part of my requirements for graduation or something like that. Uh, anyway, 
So I took the art course and they had one of those models that, you know, kind of drop their um, assets there. And it was pretty fun to paint up a nude, but, uh, but also fruit. Uh, and when I was painting up fruit, <laughs> uh, the teacher just quickly said, all right, you in that end of the room paint up this fruit ball and you on the opposite end of the room paint up the fruit, uh, fruit ball and it's the same fruit ball. So it should look the same, right? They're both painting the same thing. And then I was like, well, the perspective is different, so it's going to look different. And he said, bingo, exactly. Uh, since you have, and you're both painting the same thing, we can be painting the same model, our perspectives are different. So it's going to come out a little different, and that's cool. They're, we're both painting the same thing, but it's gonna come out a little different. Be okay with that, be okay with the variation. Like, I look at Golden Demon win winners, and I look at Slayer Sword winners, and it's like, I'm gonna paint the same miniature uh, that Richard Gray painted, right? He has his own approach to painting, some of the techniques I could adopt, but I am not Richard Gray, and he's not me. So we have totally different uh, painting styles and approaches, you know. Are there things that I want to be more like him and see from his perspective? Absolutely. Are there some things that I feel like I don't need to change right now? Absolutely. And, and I'm going to stick to what works for me. Ultimately, you have to be happy with your product. And as long as you're happy with your product and not stressed out by it, there it is. All right. So uh, using those inks, you're going to see a really subtle the variety of the highlights in there. But um, once it dries, it is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and you see I'm painting a lot of time in that because people are, this is a big gun. Like it is a huge gun, right? So, and it's unique to Canis Rex, this gun in particular. So what you wanna do is, it's gonna be an emphasis on it as the model, you want to spend time with it. You really wanna make sure that it comes out very, very well. All right, so uh, right now, uh, I mean, what I'm doing here is reinforcing the black line. So I'm trying to black line uh, little areas and separate uh, little gears and cogs and making sure that I'm, I'm having a line between them. Uh, and you know, you, you need to do it. Black lining, I learned, you really need to do because it adds definition to your model. And I've painted models and I never black lined before. And I was like, oh gosh, why doesn't it, come out the way it looks like on the on the cover art or something like that you know what am i doing wrong what am i missing and i looked really closely and it, i can't stress this one enough uh when you're analyzing somebody else's artwork you look at it and you say oh well, that's cool and then a lot of people just move on don't move on do not move on blow up this picture put it up in front of you and stare at it and come up with 10 things that make it look cool uh, and when you do something like that you're looking at it you know you're not looking at your phone you're not looking away you're just looking directly at the piece of art what you're doing is you're breaking it down yes you get that initial value of wow that looks amazing their artwork looks amazing right but then you get into the next section of that the next level as you're continuously watching and analyzing the picture you're saying what makes that look amazing? You know, what parts of that can I replicate in my miniature? What parts of that um, uh, 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 make it what it is? You know, make it its own divisional uh, stunning artwork. What kind of, is it the contrast, right? Is it the black lining? Is it the definition? Are the shadows on point? Are uh, there's a reflection? Is there a secondary reflection in the shadows? This is huge. This is huge, right? So, um, as I was studying this art book that I, I picked up, uh, I realized that when it comes to light, right, I'm studying light. When you put something that is a color. Uh, let's say red, like a red ball, right? And you put it against the white wall and you shine light on it, part of that red reflects onto the white wall. Yes, and it could be in the shadows or whatever, but the thing is part of the object, if it's brightly colored, is going to reflect on the things that are around it, even in the shadows. So if you have like a red uh, item, you want to put a little bit of red in the shadows, you know, and the secondary reflection going on even in the shadows. And that really just makes it look realistic. All right. So where am I with this? You can see on one end, it doesn't have a lot of definition. The other end, it does. I'm bringing up that definition in there, uh, making sure all the plugs and stuff like that, like all the energy nodes in there are completely done as well. Getting all the details done. And, you know, I'm starting to get really pretty happy with uh, the gun. 
<laughs> or yeah, that cannon, uh, and it looks like a huge tuning fork. In my opinion, but uh, it's a cool tuning fork, a golden tuning fork, uh, tuning fork of uh, death and destruction. The golden tuning fork, fork of death and destruction should be like up. Uh, there should be a T-shirt made out of that. All right, time for last cannons. I have a friend that always says you, you don't have a problem big enough that a last cannon cannot solve. <laughs> he loves that last cannon. I painted the last cannon uh, black, and what I'm doing is I'm black lining, I'm white lining, or edge highlighting. <laughs> uh, edge highlighting or white lighting, I like to use with that. Uh, I'm using ink. Uh, Ronnie FW inks again using the side of brush and not the tip of the brush and I'm using a stiff brush I'm using um, a series 7 uh, Windsor Newton series 7 brush which has a great point to it I'm using those inks now be careful with inks they they I praise that they flow very well I play praise that they flow very well and and having some in your belly of your brush is great uh, the flow itself can get away from you uh, in more ways than one so one, if you put too much and load the brush way, way too much, it's going to like, you know, splatter all over the place and just roll right off your brush. Not good. So that's why it's very important to wick your brush off on something before you touch it to your miniature, uh, because all that overspill, uh, let it happen on a napkin or something like that instead of on your miniature. All right. One, two, uh, since it has, uh, such a high flow, uh, it will flow to, uh, inside your brush like it'll flow a black flow inside your brush and that might you know mess up your bristles if you don't uh be careful with it and make sure you rinse out your brush thoroughly and clean your brush so if you're going to use inks for uh white lining aka here um uh, edge highlighting then make sure that you frequently frequently rinse out your brush and make sure that none of that ink dries in the ferrule of the brush uh, separating and ruining ultimately ruining your brush um, now with all things like your brush you can take care of it but everything has a shelf life so eventually your brushes are gonna go kaput on you even the Windsor and Newtons so uh, be careful and mindful of that uh, when you take care of your brushes they last longer but ultimately your brushes are gonna die on you uh, FYI uh, especially if you use them with washes because washes have the same uh, flow rate as like inks so it will sop into the brush including the ferrule of the brush and if you do not wipe it off efficiently then it will just like, you know, it will ruin your brush. All right, adding these edge highlighting, uh, white to black edge highlighting, I feel like it's a must because it really just adds definition to your plain black gun. See that? You see how it just, just brings some life into that? It just really does. And it's not difficult to do at all. Being that it's a Windsor and Newton, it does have a belly and it does retain a lot of the ink in that belly. And that's awesome for you because it means you can edge highlight longer and get a lot more accomplished without loading your brush again or, or dipping it into there. Um, you can do this process with uh, FW Ink White or Payne's Gray, because when you put gray next to a black object, it looks white, you know? All right, here it is. I put the gun on and it's looking great. Like it's really coming together now. Uh, end in sight. Um, I'm gonna add on that tabard right in the middle and I'm gonna try to get it uh, even. Now I'm going to use uh, gel uh, glue, right? Uh, Loctite. Um, and you know, gel is really good because it, it actually it actually holds the piece there just a bit. You know, it gives you a little more control there. It's a super control. I try to dry it a little and get it tacky before I put it on there. I just blew on it and then just trying to section it in. Now, you want it to drape just right. You want it to come straight down. You don't want it to be a little too back. I mean, could, there could be a breeze there, but I don't know. You'd have to represent the breeze throughout the entire uh, miniature. So what you want to do is you want to stand it up. Right? So this way, if it wiggles back and forth, oop, his mask fell off. If it wiggles back and forth, <laughs> then, you know, it'll just go straight down the center of gravity. Um, I don't know why the mask just came off. It just, it just did. And I'm gonna have to uh, glue that back on. Uh, not a big problem. 
I'm gonna get uh, cement here so it can just like melt into place. And that's one of the things I use. I use uh, cement when I just want to make sure when I absolutely have to have it stick on. Use the cement, it'll melt it into place and then you'll have to break it off, literally break it off. Not break the glue off, break the actual piece off, you know. <laughs> Ain't going anywhere now. Uh, there you go, put the uh, mask on. I'm gonna have to let all that dry, all right? Um, Right now, I have uh, the, the Canis Rex shield. For some reason, uh, the kit did not come with an extender piece for that. So what I did was, is I took some green stuff and I kind of plopped it in there. Uh, and I have to wait for that to dry. Now, that usually takes 24 hours to dry, but we ain't got time for that. So I just have to be ultra careful with it. Arr, there it is. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let me go into the chest piece here. And here's what I messed up. Rob, don't write it in that direction. Turn it upside down, turn it upside down. But I didn't. All right, so I write Canis Rex uh, backwards here. But here's what I'm showing you again. I did in the shield, but I'm gonna do it again onto this chest piece right here. You start with the R and then you go all the way to the end, the X. You start with the beginning of whatever you're trying to write. And then you go all the way to the last letter of the thing that you're trying to write. And then just like kitty corner and write one letter at a time until you meet in the middle. Best way to write anything uh it saved me countless of times doing this technique and i've learned the hard way don't let my uh failures of you know just messing up time and time again learn from my mistakes here and do it this way i learned this technique i highly recommend if you're going to write something out just don't straight write it out kitty quarter letters and meet in the middle is your best option uh, one letter at a time and you'll get the entire thing written and it's just so less stressful it really is uh, again when you're writing it you want to trace over it uh using the micro pan if you're really good with the brush you can use uh you know you can make calligraphy if you want to um again something i need to practice and in order to practice i'm going to have to just like take some test miniatures you know i'm thinking reaper miniatures because i do have a lot of reaper miniatures that i do want to paint and uh they are probably going to end up on the channel uh where i want to do oil painting that's another thing that i'm trying to do is oil painting and um learning how to use oil paint uh, and on a miniature like literally just putting it on. Um, I'm watching uh, Vince V, who is uh, telling me that um, when you when you are using oil paints, it's a subtractive method. And that means you put the paint on and then you start deleting paint off, which is weird, right? Uh, deleting paint off, what does that mean? Well, what you do is you, you plop the, the oil paint on, right? And you blend it in, and then you go into the mineral spirits and you start wicking some of that paint off on the edges, blending it in. It's pretty, uh, pretty amazing uh <laughs> technique to do i've seen it done but still my brain is not registering so i do have some reaper miniatures uh which i i joined their kickstarter uh and i got like a ton of miniatures uh for reaper uh and 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 I have to do something with them. And of course, they're going to be content for the channel. And you actually don't see that behind me. Like I, I put that into, um, I put that into another, um, like another case. They're, they're in my shelving unit and I like log them away. And now I know I have a whole bunch of other miniatures that I can actually experiment on. It's always good to have experimental miniatures. Uh, it's always good to have experimental miniatures on the side where you can actually delve in and try something you've never tried before, right? Um, and just get to it, you know? Like really, uh, it's really, really important to be able to do that. All right, finally, getting back to writing, and I'm just gonna trace here with my micro pen. I don't know where I was, uh, got distracted. You know, with this process of painting the Night Titan, it's not like I'm all focused all the time, you know? <laughs> I do get distracted by so many things, and my distractions uh, delay my painting process. Hey, here's a thing for you. If you limit the amount of distractions you have, the more painting you will get done. Period, right? Makes sense. So uh, in your paint area, don't have a whole bunch of stuff that might distract you, like, you know, that book that you wanted to thumb through, a new magazine that just came in the mail. Don't put that in your, your hobby area because your hobby area is just for hobbying. You know, that's it. You know, stay true to that. 
All right, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, I put Libertaris. Libertaris, that's what I was looking at uh, on there. Again, I put it upside down, so. Oh, well, got to go. <laughs> it came out really well, though, <laughs> for my intention. Um, unfortunately, it was upside down. But, you know, there it is. It looks good. <laughs> This is when I realized, oh my gosh, what did I do, right? So everything is dry right there, um, and I'm going to put the uh, the chest piece on. And I'm like, oh yeah, all right, so let me get it so you can see it uh, right there. And I'm take the chest piece off, and this is when I realize. <laughs> you ever did that? You ever put and get into uh, really far into a miniature, and then you realize, oh no, what did I just do? But at this point, I'm like, you know what? I don't care. <laughs> I'm just going to put it on there. And if somebody notices, that's great. And as of yet, I've used it on the table twice now. Nobody has noticed. Ha 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 Right? I'm putting a lot of this uh, glue onto it. Uh, this uh, cement glue. And I'm going to cement it into place, a place. Uh, just melt it right on there. And there you go. <laughs> Now, you really shouldn't have, like, plastic gloves next to cement glue. I don't know. I think it'll eat through it. But, oh, well. You know, there it is. All right. Time to get into some of the scroll work. And I'm going to show you how I do scroll work for purity seals. Okay. Um, I painted it, um, well, black first. And then I put bone color. And now what I'm doing is just slowly putting in lines you to see that and you don't want them to be absolutely smooth lines you know you're supposed to be like writing so you know you want to give it a little wiggle you know just a little bit of, just wiggle it just a little bit <laughs> i could not help that one also showing my age right there all right so I'm gonna do the scroll work with each one of these and you're gonna see the process. Uh, and if you wanna get really good at the scroll work, do all the scrolls, all the scrolls. And <laughs> the more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. You're gonna notice like the, the last one you do is gonna be the better than the first one you did. And that's just natural progression of it. Do so many of it, it becomes second nature. All right, there it is. I'm happy with that scroll work right there. Uh, going on to the next one, I'm gonna do all of them right here. All right. Now what I'm doing is doing the actual uh, seals. Very simple, using the same red that I'm using throughout the miniature. Uh, you have that Mephiston red. Um, and you have some Wild Rider red as well. You could throw that in there. Uh, yeah, just for a highlight. And that's what you do. So I'm just like, have the blue tack there, painting it by hand, getting them all done in one shot. Um, the closest thing to batch painting I ever do <laughs> are the purity seals right here. Uh, I really don't like to batch paint, but yeah, since they're purity seals, it really doesn't take too much to get them done. And, you know, it's time efficient. Really, it is. But they look amazing. They really do. You're going to have to let them dry completely before you get into there. But wow, you know, the effect here is pretty amazing. All right, time to... Time to decorate this guy right up. <laughs> Fun stuff. All right. So, I'm um, sorry if my hand gets in the way. <laughs> I'm starting to think, what do I want to do with these things? Uh, I'm going to put some glue there. Uh, I forgot to put the railing on, so I'm going to put the railings on the top right here before I put on the purity seal. And railings are something that can pop off really easy. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna really make sure that each one of these uh, bubbles are placed in. And um, make sure that, you know, when I actually uh, set the item in that it doesn't break off, you know, because the way you handle the miniature and stuff like that, it, it, it frequently, you know, kind of breaks off. And in doing so, um, you might mess them up. So, you know, just be conscious of that, you know. Um, all right. So next up, uh, just getting in there. I'm using these tweezers. Uh, very. And I'm holding my hand in place. I really want to have that control. I'm bracing my hand just like I do with painting. And I'm getting it straight in. Right there. That's a technique that I actually used when I was... Um, 
when I was actually painting scale models, you know, just really bracing the hands and using tweezers to that effect. It came out pretty good. Make sure that the railing uh, pops. So I painted that aluminum as opposed to, you know, going against that really dark black steel in the background. Alrighty, so uh, now for the Canis Rex symbol in the front. Again, some freehand, just like I did with all the other ones. It says Canis Rex on it uh, as well. And just gonna get that sucker off. Um, for some reason, when you're using blue tack, using a big piece of blue tack, I guess, I don't know, science. <laughs> it actually takes it off better if you had a, a big piece than if you had a small piece. So there you go. I like the way the reeds came out. I painted it green. I did that off camera. Um, camera just wasn't rolling when I was doing it and um, there it is all right I'm gonna cement glue that as well uh, Kutrama times 10 there's so many things to add on to the Canis Rex model kit and it's, it's joyous because it really just gives it that extra oomph you know it gives it that extra like um, you want to keep looking and discovering things on your model one of the things you really want to do when you're coming to uh, ha building your models is you want to keep on having little things that people find you know like have a little squirrel running through the the mechanicum or something like that like I don't know like little things that people can discover especially if you're uh, painting for competition uh, you want to add those little surprises throughout your miniature so people are staring and staring remember when I say you look at a picture and you say well what makes this look great well judges for painting competitions stare at your miniature and say well what makes this look great yeah it's stunning that's great but what additional stuff is there and they keep on scouring and they find new things and they're like wow i was just looking at it for like three minutes and i never noticed that it had fill in the blank all right base time because it's all about that base uh like i do with all my models you gotta want to create a footprint right so you gotta want to know where is your model gonna stand on the base uh, and this way you can base all around that area and you know really just you can fill up everything else but do not fill in these spots because this is where your miniature is actually going to stand so you're like you know reserve parking you know <laughs> so what I use is usually uh, any white paint will do uh, against that black uh, base there that back um, Standard blast black plastic for the base. And when I start, you know, modeling and putting all the accoutrement onto it, I just want to make sure that I just don't, you know, I want a, a level surface for the miniature to stand on. So this way the connection that I make to the base is sturdy. Usually I put on a pretty elaborate base. So uh, in doing elaborate base, elaborate bases are heavy. And since when I'm moving the miniature on the table, I'm usually grabbing the actual miniature itself and moving it along the table. So what I'm gonna want it to do is make sure that the connection of the model to the base is absolutely as secure as I possibly can make it. So in order to do that you go to reserve parking for this and using this method right here works phenomenally for me and I make sure that I do this for every single one of my builds every single one of my builds uh, when I'm gonna do the base especially if I'm gonna load it with a whole bunch of cool stuff on the base uh, I want to make sure that I have the height correct I want to make sure that I have the footprint correct i've done uh bases for other people and they said well i don't know about you know uh the base and you know just pay me whatever it's fine but it's not fine because you really got to make the footprint for it uh so this way you can accommodate the miniature that you want on the base and that's how i usually roll so i think uh in the future if i am making a base for someone you know, a uh, custom base for someone, I'm going to ask them to do this one step, you know, and let me know where the footprint is. Uh, and let me know if there's the height, like in between the legs, like I know not to put anything where the tabard is, because that's going to like, you know, get in the way. And I don't want to do that. So height is important, but definitely the footprint is important. So you can actually, you know, know where you're putting the miniature. And it really doesn't take that long. You see the process right here, slowly just moving it around and just white lining, getting it as close to the miniature as possible. Do not paint your actual miniature. Although, I don't know. I mean, uh, you could put in some wash in the bottom, even if you do, or make it into a scrape, even if you do. So it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm generally a clean painter, so I, I'm very careful. <laughs> uh, yep. And I get that down when you lift it off. There's magically the footprint. 
there it is. So, and there you go. It's like a controller. Now I know that um, I'm gonna have to, I'm taking some pine bark, tree bark, right? And I, I'm just laying it in. I really like using it. I used to use, um, I used to use uh, like the board, the, the poster board. Uh, but uh, I don't use poster board anymore, like for rocks and stuff like that. I, I definitely use uh, bark, like tree bark. Pine tree bark is amazing. The rocks that they yield are absolutely amazing. You can get them from your uh, hardware stores, actually, if you go to the nursery section and get some uh, pine bark. But the thing is, is that you're going to have to, like, I bake it because if there's any microorganisms in there, uh, I make sure that I kill them before I put them onto my, so I don't create fungus or something like that on my miniature. So that's really, really important. I wash them and then I bake them. All right, so I'm gonna use some terrain bits uh, so that I can um, just really add to the overall uh, feel of the model. I'm gonna use these terrain bits. Really important uh, to make a decision and stick to it. I'm gonna put this uh, broken building uh, piece in the back. I don't want it to detract from the miniature, but I figure it, since it's in the back and it's part of that exoskeleton stuff that I really didn't paint that much, uh, I want to add something to it. So I'm going to do that. And it came from a previous build. This is why I save my bits. Like I save my bits for my projects because you never know when it's going to end up on a base somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I do like to get creative with my bases, so, and there it is. I had just an extra bit, and I'm going to just use it for my base. It makes it look really, really, really cool. Um, and again, I when I first did this, I didn't draw out what I wanted. I was just, like, putting it on there, and I'm like, hey, this would be cool if I added this. And then I just popped it on there and see what would happen, right? It's like, pop! And I want to get the height right, so I had to actually put the miniature on. It's not glued in. It's just standing there. Uh, but I wanted to glue everything in place so this way it's not hitting anything and it's not obstructing anything. The footprint is secure. Everything is just like in place uh, for this. So it's pretty cool. Oh man. Um, and I'm very happy with the way it turned out. You know, again, verticality is a thing. Um, trying to see is it leaning too much one way I thought I thought it started leaning a little bit back there so I kind of go back and I kind of move it into place all right uh, I am super gluing the tree bark to the base as well I wanted to get that in there um, because later on I'm going to use white glue to do like the little rocks and features and like that but super gluing that into the base is super important so I'm going to move the miniature off the base I am going to center things and get the rock in the middle now that I know that it's not obstructing anything and just doing one again again super gluing these this part right here uh, I find this very useful because the big rock pieces when you're just putting white glue tend to like separate and break off and brittle off and I want them to be secure especially big pieces like that so I'm gonna put that in there and you know you can be you can be liberal when it comes to adding a lot of glue onto the bottom pieces right there because everything else is going to get covered up in white glue and I'm going to put stones in there and everything else so it's like it doesn't matter you can have some fun with it that's part of the freedom I like with creating bases like this is that I have the freedom of um, just like throwing it on there slapping it on there not being super careful with it and it coming out pretty uh, amazing now when it comes to the base you do want to have, well, I like to have elaborate bases, but I don't want it to be the star of the show. Like, I want to make sure that um, the base has interesting things, but it doesn't steal or rob away from the star of the show. The star of the show is the actual miniature itself. I don't want it to detract from the miniature. I just want to add to the environment that it is in. All right, so uh, next up, uh, we are trying to decide I put a wall up in front as well so there's a wall in the front uh, a wall in the back with uh, some glass in there uh, as well like a shattered building in the back so it's pretty cool uh, right there so now time for the white glue uh, yeah that's right white glue and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a really uh, messed up brush and I'm gonna put white glue because I don't care and this is why you save your very big messed up brushes uh, because of the white glue and I'm looking at some kind of detritus or, or basing material for this. I didn't know what I was going to use. I do have that there. I'm going to put that for inspiration. Not really sure if I'm going to use that or not, but uh, hey, you know what? I have it there. 
I uh, also have some road gravel. I like road gravel. Like finely ground down road gravel and uh, I use it a lot for my Space Wolf bases. It's part of my theme. Uh, you may want to wet your brushes as well just to get that flowing. The thing about white glue is uh, after a while it gets really thick and you want to thin it down. Now you don't want to thin it down too thin and you know you want to make it thick but you just want it to flow off your brush. So uh, wetting your brush or pre-wetting your brush um, pretty important in my opinion to be able to do. Um, if you're going to use uh, white glue and if it's going to be Elmer's, I like to use glue all, not the school glue. Uh, glue all is a little more, uh, it's a little thicker and I think it's stickier, uh, if that's a thing, um, than the school glue. And it has just make sure that nothing kind of like pops off later on that you're going to regret. And what I'm doing is painting with glue. Why not, right? <laughs> Paint it up with glue. Um, Again, make sure you don't uh, you, you you paint within the lines there and do not mess with that footprint. But you want to get it as close to the footprint as possible so it looks like as if it's living in the environment um, as much as possible. But you know, if you miss a spot or two, it's not really a big deal. Again, working with bases, it's not as restrictive. Like it's just so open-ended and organic that I, I find that there's a lot of freedom in, in working with bases. Like I could just I would say let my hair down, but I'm bald, right? <laughs> but you do, you know? You wanna make sure with these uh, tree bark uh, that there are gaps underneath there. You wanna get glue underneath there as well. You know, I can stuff it into the areas uh, that you have there. But I'm gonna show you the entire process right here. Uh, painting around, getting really close. And this is an exciting part for me, not because, not just because it's very liberating, um, it's also because, you know, when you're working on the base, you, there's an end in sight, like you're done with the miniature, like you're done, right? You know, you just have some fun. Now you're just like, you know, messing around. So whenever I start working on a base, uh, and I do it in that order, like I finish the miniature first and then I work on the base, uh, it just signals, like it gives me endorphins that are released saying, oh, Rob, you finished another miniature. And now he's just like, you know, work on the base, paint it up and done, right? He's just like... Ah, oh. <laughs> so, so much fun. All right, so I'm I went with road gravel, very finely great road gravel. I'm just like stuffing it in places. I'll show you, it's sort of like sprinkling rainbow sprinkles on your ice cream. <laughs> just um, I like rainbow sprinkles on my ice cream. I really do. And um, yeah, just getting it on there. I, I do use a cutting mat, so this way I can take any extra bits that you know do not land. Uh, on the actual base and put it back into the road gravel container that I have right there. Uh, and that's a that's a spice container. So I get spices and stuff like that in these kind of containers at a farmer's market. And I use them for my road gravel uh, later on after the spices are done. Now, some people actually use spices in their build. I was always told that organic things like that decay after a time, even if you varnish them. So I kind of shy away from using spices spices uh in my my builds unless you know it's going to be a temporary thing it's for a painting competition where afterwards i don't care you know if it deteriorates or not but if it's for the long term or something like that you generally do not use spices uh when it comes to basing materials although i hear coconut fiber is the bomb.com i do have to get that for vein uh for vines and stuff like that especially if i want to do a jungle scene which i think i am going to do jungle scenes i really do want to try something like that i think it'd be a lot of fun all right so when it comes to the roll gravel what kind of try this that you use you can want to like stuff it again into the cooks and crevices of the uh tree bark uh, so this way, you know, it unifies the piece. That's the whole thing with this. You want it to be unified, right? You want to make sure that the environment looks like it's like everything belongs in that environment. Like it's not just, hey, somebody just put tree bark in the middle of this um, base and that's it. You know, no, you want to have, you want to tie things in. That's the important thing. Always tie things in. Once you have a, um, once you have a theme and you tie things in, it's going to look a lot more organic right um that you have uh within your base right and you want everything to work together you want your miniature to work with the environment that it's in now i'm just taking off all the excess here 
I'm just moving it around and taking it off. You, you could blow it, but it'll get everywhere. Uh, turn it upside down, you know, shake it up a little bit. Shake it up. <laughs> Right, and get all the excess rocks, uh, road gravel in there, and it's pretty cool because you know all the excess stuff you can reuse it for other bases. And there's just so much. It's like the gift that keeps on giving, and it's at the end of the road for me. I just go at the end of the road. I am, I am, I am pretty musical. I I whistle while I work. I, I sing while I work. All right, if you go over the line over there for the footprint, you can just use your uh, X-Acto blade and kind of just like push everything into place because it is white glue, so it's malleable for a while until it dries. So it takes a bit before it completely dries. And that, you know, you can afford you some time to manipulate anything on the base except for the pine bark, which you use in super glue. Uh, so this way you can shape it to your needs right there. Very, very simple way to control. And whenever you're painting miniatures, it's all about having control. Looks pretty cool, I think. I mean, you'll see it a little better once it's painted. I gotta get it onto, um, I gotta get it onto a um, pill bottle and paint it up. Now what I want to do is I'm adding AK Interactive dry ground and I'm just adding some uh, little bits of like dirt. I'm just adding some dirt to this because it just looks like rocks and big rocks, right? So where's the dirt? You know, it's got to be dirty. So uh, randomly I'm going to put some dirt here and there. I'm going to paint some on, just experimenting with that. Uh, again, adding more layers to it. You know, life is very rarely one dimensional. Uh, whenever you're looking at a scene, you're looking at a whole bunch of things that tell a story. Like, you know, if you see propaganda on the floor or something like that, it's like, well, somebody put that up there. You know what I mean? At some point, if you see like a can of tuna fish broken on the floor, well, somebody ate that and tossed it there. Like, what's the story behind it? And that's what you're trying to do with your bases. You're trying to tell a mini story. So I wanted to add some dirt and grime to this. So this way it's not just like clean rocks appeared on your base for no reason whatsoever. No, that doesn't make sense. Right, so dirt and detritus are going to be stuck into these rocks uh, because they've been there for a while, right? And uh, nobody has tended to the building; it's broken apart, and nobody cared for it. So you know, just adding that uh, soot and dirt onto it, uh, add more dimensions to it. And I do like using AK uh, Interactive; they have a lot of paste and putty, but you don't have to stick to that. Liquitex have some modeling paste that you can use. Uh, you take some modeling paste and add a little bit of like really finely grained sand to it see yeah I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of using regular sand because I think that the granules are too big for the miniature scale so uh, I shy away from just using stray sand one of the things you might want to do is play around with some modeling paste and some baking soda that might help as well uh, also uh, you do have woodland scenics that has different kinds of things that you can use as well and incorporate it to modeling paste in order to create something like this but AK interactive already already has something done for me. So why not mess around with it? You're gonna see I had some water in there in the brush and I'm just trying to make sure that it starts flowing off the brush because it's starting to get stuck on there. And I can't say it's the easiest thing to work with this modeling paste, but it does look realistic, you know? So kind of like plop it in there. Not being too careful, just being mindful where it's going. Like, I want to tell a story with it. I want, you know, basically, if the tree bark doesn't mend with the floor very well and there's like these big gaps in between, I want to like fill in those gaps with like dirt and stuff like that, you know? Uh, and I don't want to get too much into that because later on I'm going to put snow on it. So I can do the same thing with that, but I just want to add another layer to this, you know, just add more dimension to your, uh, your base and telling that story. What story you're going to tell with your base? That's the question you need to ask yourself. So, uh, start thinking and creating a base. You're going to have to want to start thinking of the story you are going to want to tell, right? You got to start thinking about, well, in this environment, what? happened you know and what you're seeing is the aftermath of that like the aftermath of what happened right what well, like i said before if you have like a can of tuna somebody ate it and the aftermath is that they tossed it aside and there you go later on i'm going to add some um, bullets onto the floor of this telling the story that there was a gunfight in here um so yeah so adding to the story is important again i got a little bit of overzealous uh when it came to uh this paste right here and i'm using the back of the exacto blade just to clear up some of that mess right there 
<laughs> making sure that the footprint is just isolated and this way the connection of the miniature to the base is secure. Because this is going to get heavy because we're, we're actually adding a lot of stuff to it. Again, filling in the gaps. Uh, it's starting to come out really well. I think it's going to be good, really organic and it's really good. You're going to notice it blend in together when I paint it, right? So I'm going to uh, prime it up and then I'm going to paint it uh, the, the the gray tones that I want to paint it into. Uh, and it's just going to really, um, it's going to be a background superstar, you know? Because it is literally like the background of the story, right? So it's going to be a background superstar and... Um, yeah, I want, wanted to play a role, not the starring role, but a role uh, in the miniature and telling the story itself. Uh, fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Oh, man. So, uh, playing 40K, this edition, 9th edition. Uh, are you playing 40K, 9th edition? What do you think about it? What do you think about having more, like... Um, terrain features like all the terrain stuff i i'm excited because i want to be able to get up and close and personal with my space wolves especially now that my mini marines have two wounds which i've always said the mini marines i mean if you're playing against primaris just give the mini marines two wounds and even things out you know just that's it you know just even it out. Not only that, you know, Space Wolves are getting more attacks. And they're like insane when it comes to attacks. Uh, <laughs> and I love that I can get up close and personal. Usually my Space Wolf gets blown off the table. But now that uh, things are obscuring terrain that you can't see through it. So it'll give me, uh, afford me the opportunity uh, to get up close and personal with my uh, miniatures. All right, so I put this up on the base. Excited about 9th edition. And now I'm just going to prime it up. Uh, really just trying to unify the piece. I did wait for everything to dry. Uh, it took a little bit of time there. Uh, but I am making hecka good progress when it comes to this build. I'm actually doing, uh, I'm really staying on task. I'm getting things done a lot faster than I thought I was going to get it done. I thought it'd be close to the wire, but this is not even close at this point. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Um, I think even with building the miniature, like if I put that time with building the miniature as well, I'd still come under the 24 hour uh, limit there. So, you know, I'm pretty good. All right, so painting up some uh, gray tones here. I do like to use heavy blue-gray. I like to have the blue-gray because I'm going to put a lot of snow into it, so I like a bluish-gray, but you can use any bluish-gray or cold gray that you kind of have, uh, or if you have just a standard gray and you want to add some blue ink to it and make it blue, you can do that as well, you know? Anything cold and dark. So I'm going to get the dark first, and then I'm going to add a lighter uh, gray for the highlights. Remember when you're applying this kind of grays, uh, you're going to want to leave some black in there for the shadows. So I'm like shooting it from far away. I'm not getting too, too close with it. And with the highlights, I'm getting a little more closer because, you know, I want to hit the highlights in specific areas. And that's what I'm going to do. So start with a darker uh, gray and then go into a lighter gray, and then you're pretty much good to go. Uh, and you want to tie it into the building as well. So everything's getting this gray treatment. You want to do a zenithal highlighting when it comes to this gray right here. Uh, you don't want to get all over coverage. You want some of that black that you put for the primer to shine through on the shadows. So, you know, you try to preserve that and be conscious of where your airbrush is. Uh, I keep it further away. I leave some of the black in there. Uh, some of the areas I hit more than once because I really want them to pop out. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, usually when you put like a dark line next to a light line, you are developing contrast because anything, you know, next to black looks brighter uh, if you put it next to it. So that's something interesting to consider as well. Um, there's a lot of little things to consider right there. You want to leave some of the black, do not get the full coverage of it. And that adds a little bit of dimension uh, to your uh, piece. You know, I'm really starting to think uh, what of the little detritus I'm going to actually add to it after I'm done painting it. All right, time for the time for the highlights. Okay, uh, and you can get uh, a lot of variation. 
Oh, I think these are highlights. Yeah, it looks like the highlights. All right, so it's a lighter gray right there. Just hitting the rocks right in the tips wherever I think the light should bounce off of the most, right? Not covering everything. I'm getting really specific. These are highlights. So I'm getting really specific as to where I'm adding some of these highlights to and really making it dynamic. Again, still retaining some of that black in there uh, to add color and variation to your model, right? Uh, you want to have those transitions. You want to have it going from all the way black to almost white, right? So that's why I'm using a light gray right now. Going from almost, well, well a black going to almost white. And then having that contrast, making it pop, you know, you, you want all this work that you're doing for the base. You want people to notice it. You just don't want it to be the superstar. In other words, uh, you want to draw attention to the star of the, the model. You want to uh, draw your attention to the model and then you want people to stay and looking at your stuff and then finding some stuff on the base and be like, wow, I didn't know this had that. Wow, this also had this feature and I didn't know about that, you know? So, you know, it's like the gift that keeps on giving uh, when it comes to your base, right? So telling a story is like having even more, right? adding even more. It's like, hey, I came for the miniature and I stayed for the base, right? <laughs> I came for the free pizza and I stayed for the conversation, right? <laughs> um, so much fun doing these bases. Really so much fun. And I've never gotten so aggressive with bases before. Like I started doing, actually, uh, after I did the Night Titan for competition, I really went to town with my Flesh Eater Quartz bases. And ever since I did that, I've grown as a, uh, an artist and really just wanted to uh, get more and more established with the bases, get more and more uh, dramatic with the bases. And I think it's a lot of fun to work with those. Um, and, you know, you're telling a story, you're, you're literally telling a story with your, uh, your paint here, you know, you really are. All right, now it's time for the base. Now, one of the things that I wanted to include that I did differently, because every model that I build, I want to challenge myself with something different, is that I wanted to make glass, shattered glass, and how would I would incorporate that into the basic uh, scenery that I do. And what I used was uh, an old CD case that were glass, right? And then what I did was I, I, I kind of bend it, I took a, a, a a towel wrapped it around, took a hammer and just like started smashing it up so it cracks and, and all that kind of funky stuff. And then I took pieces out and I just clipped over the edges to fit what I needed for shattered glass. And then on the floor, so it looks like it's actually shattered, I put some of the pieces in there. Now, one of the things you're gonna have to realize is that it's too clean to just leave it there. So what I did was, is I took some of the Citadel shades, and you can use any kind of uh, ink washes or anything like that, uh, and I just put some grime uh, speckled on there. Now you can do uh, any kind of effect you want, you want blood splatter or whatever, uh, you can add it to that. Just make sure that you incorporate some paint onto the clear part, so this way it looks like part of your base. Speaking of which, we're just about done. All right, so the end is in sight. Let's Let's take this CD case right here, and we're about to destroy this thing. If you happen to have CD cases, um, a lot of the optical stuff is going away in technology. Uh, I've heard from a lot of people who, um, who that's their profession. So what I'm left with is a whole bunch of CD cases. So what do I do with that? Well, of course I use it for hobbying. I mean, why wouldn't you, right? So here I have a really small hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the CD case, and I think you know what's going to happen next, right? But, you know, I don't want uh, CDs to, like, splinter everywhere, so I'm um, coming up with a plan so this way it doesn't go everywhere. So, taking it from, like, uh, Jewish weddings where they do Mazel Tov and they break the glass, which is what I'm trying to do right here. I'm just going to bang this. I don't know if it's going to work or not. doesn't seem like it is. Uh, all right. We'll try it this way. All right. Let's give it a go whacker <laughs> or, or maybe a couple of whackers and see what happens here. We're trying to crush it, you know, and see what happens. Now, this is pretty loud, so you may want to double up on this and see if you can break it that way. Um, but the idea is uh, to smash it to smithereens as much as possible. And um, I'll tell you, these CD cases are pretty resilient, so you may want to like, you know, 
find the way to really just smash and break it apart. Just, you know, watch yourself and do not, you know, get yourself cut or anything like that, which you can. So just be really, really mindful of that. Uh, maybe instead of a paper towel, you want to use a, uh, a cloth or something like that. Um, but what you have here is shattered bits, you know, and this is great, and especially the small bits too, because you're going to use those later as well, you know, to add to the overall ambiance of the piece. So I'm going to take these bits since they seem a little large for me and I'm going to smash them up even more. Um, <laughs> the more the merrier, I guess. Uh, I'm going to break that one with my hand. And, you know, it does break quite easily. So much better than actually using glass. So, yeah. So I'm going to smash these to, to smithereens as well. And see if I can just, like, really get it down. So I got a whole bunch of shards right there you see there. You might want to get a container for that. Now I'm using a special glue here. Uh, this is uh, Model Masters. Uh, it's from Testers. And it is clear glue. Like, I mean, clear glue. So really important to use clear glue for this because if you use regular uh, regular super glue, it, it kind of fogs up the glass. You know, it fogs up the glass because it has to degas. This glue that I'm using right here does not do that. So uh, Model Master Series uh, clear glue is pretty good. So what I'm doing is I'm just fitting it to size. See that broken glass right there? So cool and such an easy way to add the shattered glass effect to your models you have to make sure you put enough glue so this way it doesn't fall apart and put it in an area where you're not handling it that much because it's not you know a load bearing uh glue that you're using there but it will disappear and you will not notice it when adding uh shards of glass to your miniature now this thing is way too big right <laughs> so we're not gonna use that one and um, something like that. I don't know. We're going to keep on using bits and pieces. And that's the thing about uh, shattering these glasses and using this. You can just pick and choose which one you think would look the coolest. Now, this one looks really destroyed in the scrot. Uh, and I like the way that that is uh, going there. Uh, and, you know, you do have options when it comes to this, uh, which is pretty cool. You know, um... If it's not perfect to size, you can make it perfect to size. Uh, you can snap off bits, but I'm going to use here um, these clippers because that is a plastic piece. It's not going to hurt it any. Uh, you can use the clippers in order to shape it. Uh, and uh, that's the interesting thing here. You have an uh, infinite amount of choices when it comes to shattered glass. And there's just so many. And I'm gonna like actually have a container and I'm gonna put all these shards of glass in it. So this way for future projects, you know, all it takes is one donor CD case and you have so much glass to play with. And it's so realistic. I've gotten so many uh, compliments on how this turned out. So, and, and I'm super happy with it. Again, not for competition, but you could use something like this for competition, like this technique you can use for competition uh, with the glass. And, you know, amaze your friends. Oh, that is just perfect right there. Look, the bent glass and everything. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely digging that. That's awesome. Um, so that's what I'm going to do there. And, you know, you're going to want to shape it up to, 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 to suit your needs. Adding glass, adding a new dimension to, uh, your base, uh, definitely ele elevates it to the next level. I'm always looking for ideas to add to my base. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to want to do is having like, you know, pain glass or, or colored glass, um, stained glass and i'm gonna do stained glass as well i'm gonna see if i can get some stained glassing uh going and um and see if i can create some of that you know and the thing about uh, stained glass is you're going to want to do the reflection of the glass on the floor as well so you may have to paint the floor in order to do that but that's it you know, that's, this could be a start with that um with doing um broken stained glass i don't know i've seen a lot of different kits when i've gone to the hobby store and how to create stained glass uh and and staining it but i can imagine that there's a dye in which you can use or possibly uh airbrushing an ink onto the glass will definitely um 
will change the color of the glass so you can actually have different colors. I'm gonna play around with that to that effect. If you've ever done stained glass, uh, let me know down in the comments below if there's anything that I should look out for, any tips or tricks that you can share with the community. Um, I'll definitely uh, try that <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, I have rubble, I have glass now. Um, one thing I did not add to this base surprisingly enough are skulls which you know in the 40k universe not adding skulls like yikes right <laughs> i don't know it came out all right uh now i'm gonna have to litter some broken glass down in in there as well and see how that as well all right so uh once i've added the glass into it what i'm doing is i'm adding shells not real shells shells down to scale how in the world do i get shells down to scale well I went to the jewelry section of uh, my hobby uh, lobby place and looking to the jewel section, I seen these like little itty bits of copper pieces that you can add to bracelets or, you know, spacers or something like that. And I just saw it and I was like, that would be absolutely perfect for uh, gun casings. Uh, and what I do is I'll take the super glue and I'll put it all over, you know, just litter it here and there. And the story which I'm trying to tell is that there was a gunfight uh, down in the base before the um, before the Night Titan came down, and. Um, I was standing there and these shells were there from previous fights. Again, telling a story on the base, I had to mention to the base. Now also, um, having a shell on top of uh, the wall there, uh, and I also put shells you know, literally everywhere. I wanna say maybe there was someone standing behind that wall and that was shooting and the shell casings kind of went everywhere. I think that's a story to tell right there. Uh, and it makes for an interesting one in my opinion. Now, I do not paint these shells. I think I think the copper is just perfect the way it is and you can paint the shells. If you don't want copper shells, you can actually have, you know, uh, metallic and if you have, um, um, Vallejo metal color, you can actually paint them if you would like to. But I really do like the brass copper sh uh, shells and they were like closer to like empty shells of a bolter uh, weapon, which <laughs> which is absolutely perfect what I need. Like I am absolutely smitten with how well the casings um, look. Now I've used these casings before on a base that I've done uh, for competition. Uh, when I say competition, I mean because I gave it away on the channel. Um, Gamecraft Dragon, which is another YouTuber, uh, actually won that base that I put the casings on and really appreciative of how that came out. And I'm doing the same thing on a larger scale with this larger base, and I'll tell you, it, it can't, I, I can never be as overjoyed. Now, also, one of the things uh, I wanted to add to it is that I have, you, if you look in the top right hand corner, um, whoops, I covered it, there's a poster there. <laughs> Of course I moved it. Um, there's a poster back there and uh, posters are really cool to add. You know, I go to Regimental Standard on the GW community website, Warhammer community's website. And if you want to have like, you know, propaganda and stuff like that, propaganda posters, you could just go to Regimental Standards and look at all the posts that they have. And they usually have a picture or two, which I put into a, a Word document. A Microsoft Word document and I shrunk the scale down. I took the picture and I really shrunk it down. I, it was a little bit of a trial and error, error to get the actual right size, but there's no real right size. I didn't shrink it down to a specific side. I just put several and see how many I can fit on one page. And I try to, you know, not obscure the detail. I want to be able to see what the poster actually says. And I put that on there, Regimental Standard. Now, you don't have to put them, uh, the posters straight up. You can you can tear pieces of the poster. It could be on sideways and put post in hastily on your walls. Uh, it could be torn up and bits and pieces of it on the bottom of your base. And you just put a little bit of uh, glue on the bottom of the base. And you can have like torn up pieces of poster right there. Some of the posters actually are, are not posters at all. They're like um, flow charts on how to deal with uh, problems, how to reload your bolter and all like all this type of stuff uh there's also even vacation posters there's this is like so many things that you can add to it 
Uh, also, you can see down on the bottom right there, uh, I have those glass pieces. Now, look at the glass pieces. They look too transparent and clean, even if they're broken. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna add some dust to it. And what in the world am I adding, you may ask? Well, that's a good question. So what I did was, is that I have these, well, powders, and you can buy pigment powder if you'd like to, but these in particular, I had a, a mortar and pestle, and I had pastel art sticks, like you can get for, um, I think I got one for five bucks, or seven bucks, and I got like every color in the rainbow, and I had a mortar and pestle, and I crushed them, and I put them in these little art containers, um, and I use them as dust, you know, and you can have pigment binder with that if you want to throw that in there and put some pigment binder in there. Uh, it'll seal it in, but if you just want a dusting, this is great to add like a dusty effect to your model uh, and your surrounding area. And it just adds a, another layer, just so you get another layer of uh, dimension to your miniature, bringing it to life. Having all these uh, added benefits or added uh, story elements within your model brings it really to life and it makes people continuously stare at your model because they just want to see what else you're adding to the mix. Now I did put the powder on the miniature itself because you know I want the, my Titan to be dusty as well uh, but at the same time I'm pretty ultra clean uh, as a painter so I kind of like leave it ultra clean uh, as well and but I you know I really want to add <laughs> clean dirt I don't know how to say that but yeah <laughs> yeah the thing about me with weathering is I'm very intentional about my weathering I just don't weather for weathering's sake I just don't throw it on anywhere uh, I put it specifically on certain areas all about control literally all about control and that's what you need uh, if you look at some of the 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 decals I put onto there, uh, I put on the Space Wolf symbol in there because, you know, Space Wolf. <laughs> Gotta have to do that. A little Ragnar Black Mane Company. But mainly, um, I have the, the Great Wolf right there uh, for Logan Grimnar. Uh, I threw that in there because, you know, that's always fun uh, to do. So, yeah, the powder really adds an effect. And you can see it's just like adding a light layer of dust, literally a light layer of brown dust to the ground, which, you know, it's the ground. So, and it's the 40K universe. So it should be a little dirty, but specifically adding it to places where it looks a little too clean. Now you can go crazy with this. I think it can get overdone. You don't want to overdo it, you know? Uh, so uh, a little here and a little there is great, but you know, just don't take the entire bucket and just like throw it on there and call it a day. Um, I mean, you can if you want to, but I, I just think that's like gonna, you're gonna lose a lot of elements and, and details to that you added in with the airbrush, that you added in with the regular brush, you know. And I don't want it to fade away to existence. I want it to be dirty, but I do want where I put the highlights to to continuously pop, you know, uh, and throw the dust in here. It's just another warm color in which you add to a cold background. Again, you're having contrasting colors, right? So the dirt is red while the stones are blue and it has contrast to it it brings your eyes down to it now it's not as pronounced as the red on the miniature and the white which really pops in your face uh, but it's that subtlety that makes you like the, the the miniature brought you in the base will keep you there uh, as well to look at more details uh, through and through it gives you uh, more uh, I guess more curb appeal, if you could say, or more uh, time in which you want to spend looking at the miniatures. Like, wow, what else did they do? Wow, what else did you do? Wow, 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 which is pretty cool. And it's cool to have that effect, especially when you have a speed build that uh, this is like a speed paint, speed build, uh, what you want to call it right there. And, you know, especially when you have that, to have all those dimensions that people want to continuously stare. I had other people who say they love this miniature and how it came out and how, you know, I, I must have spent like ages uh, on trying to get to all these effects, but actually it was uh, as quick as quick can be, <laughs> for me anyway, uh, to be able to do this. There was a lot of things that I added onto it, but it, it always comes to adding more layers onto your, your miniature and having more dimension. And you can just keep on pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. You know, to get it to that next level, to the next level, only you as the artist, only you as the hobbyist can say, yeah, this is where I want to stop. This is this is good enough. 
I'm fine here and I can move on to the next project. And me with the huge backlog that I have, I need to be able to say this uh, to myself, you know? So this, like, this setting the limits of a 24 hour project was really healthy for me because then I know not to take it too far. You know, it's not for, for uh, painting competitions, it's for uh, giggles and it looks cool and that's all that matters. And I really do enjoy now, I was totally intimidated about painting Night Titans, but now I actually enjoy painting. I like, they're so much fun, you know? Because you could just keep going and going. And like, right now, I'm just like padding and padding, and it's just like a pure joy. You know, I'm not getting it wrong. You know, I'm not, uh, it's not edge highlighting where I'm like, oh my gosh, what if I put in too much paint? Or, you know, what about the ferrule, the brush, or anything like that? I'm not really worried about uh, just about anything. I'm just padding it wrong. I was watching something on YouTube in the background. I think it was my battle report to make sure that I didn't make mistakes. Um, I do have a 40K battle report up there. Uh, you can check in the link. Um, you can check in my. Um, playlist and you can see those uh as well if you're interested in 40k battle reports uh as well aos battle reports and i have some of those coming up in the works as well all right so yep adding some dust here and there is so much fun um i, I close the the pigment because that's all i'm going to be using i'm just going to use whatever's left over i don't want to waste anything and look at that that looks really dusty old and you know the thing about this I, I didn't put any pigment binder in there so slowly but surely it's gonna you know reduce so i can you know overuse it right now and then you know as it's just using it uh in games and stuff like that a little bit of like starts coming off and stuff like that and, and just really settles in perfectly um to do that now I'm not chucking this in a, um, a bag and calling it a day. You know, I have it magnetized, so it's not really going to touch anything, but I think it's just really cool, the environment right there. Uh, definitely adding to that. And I'm going to add one more thing. You see, I think that uh, the glass is too clean, you know, uh, <laughs> way too clean. So I'm going to add a little something to that uh, as well. And let's get into that. Let's get into adding something uh, to make it dirty because the glass is way too clean on the floor. I'm going to add some FW ink sepia, right? And I'm just going to like throw in some sepia ink in there and I'm going to tint the glass uh, so it can be dirty. You know, it's on the floor. It should be dirty. It shouldn't be clean glass on the floor. Uh, so I'm just going to add a little bit here, a little bit there. You could also add uh, some wash to it. Some Serapon sepia also works uh, if you want to mix that. But yeah, this this is great for, for streaking grime and stuff like that. If you wanted to uh, add this to your 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 overall display when it comes to glass and tinting it. So I'm just gonna dab here and dab there. You, you're gonna want it to pull here and there a little bit because you know, rainwater I would think is dirty and then you know, you got the dirt, you got the rainwater and to add that effect to the glass, you know, where it streaks or, or you know, the rain hits so hard it splashes up and it splashes on the glass as well. So adding that uh, again, yet another layer uh, because I had some time, you know, honestly, I finished the project um, with some time to spare, which blew me away. I really blew me away that I'd be able to do that. So I could, it could spend a little bit of extra time on that. But even so, when I was like, I felt like, okay, I've gotten to the point where I'm comfortable with, I stopped. I could just completely stop and say, nope, no more. <laughs> That's it. Um, what an awesome project. What an awesome way to push myself uh, to get the endorphins by completing a project. It is, um, I mean, really uh, an honor um, for me to be able to bring uh, something like this to you. All right, so, you know, don't stop with the inks on the glass itself. I'm going to actually put it in the recess of those skulls right there. Uh, you want to dirty up just a little bit of everything and just like, you know, everything is touched. Everything is like just lightly touched here and there to add elements uh, to the eye and to make it a little more cohesive. Uh, I've been told that my bases are pretty realistic and pretty cool and they're just so much fun. There's so much fun. You know, one of my uh, heroes when it comes to basing and stuff like that is uh, Chris Shore. Um, he's absolutely amazing. Um, you know, and he's just like, his diorama boxes are absolutely outstanding. Like, outstanding. 
understanding, like awe-inspiring. And it makes me want to spend more time on my bases uh, as well and create a living environment for the miniature in which I worked so hard to make stand out, live in. I wanted to live in uh, uh, an area, right? So that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm gonna use panel lining right now. I never used this product before, so I wanted to try it. Yeah, first time ever using it. Let me end up the project. Uh, ruining everything, no. <laughs> I heard a lot of good things about panel lining uh, with this, and it's sort of like uh, oil pin washing, you know, but without the oil paint. So I wanted to definitely try it. So there's like uh, alcohol based, so it's going to uh, dry really quickly. This is from uh, Tamiya. Uh, some people call it Tamiya. Um, and I'm just going to add those in there because, you know, you need to black line everything. So I'm just going to throw it in there. And I'll tell you one thing. I do like the product. Um, just like everything else, it has a shortcomings. It kind of likes to get everywhere else. And I'm not really sure what to use to get rid of the excess. You see now with... With oil pin washing, if you have too much of it, you take a little bit of mineral spirits and then you wipe it off. Um, I think this, you would have to use alcohol. And if you're gonna use alcohol on a miniature, especially with acrylic paint, it's gonna eat the acrylic paint. So, you know, I just don't want to uh, put alcohol on it, you know, and, and remove it. So there, there's some upsides and there's some downsides. Uh, again, the dry time is definitely upside because you don't need that much dry time. And, uh, but the fact that this goes literally into the region recesses super quick is absolutely amazing. I do recommend the product. I try it out, you know, uh, panel lining from Tamaya. It, it's pretty awesome. It gets my seal of approval. Well, this is going to be it, ladies and gentlemen. I am tacking it up and time stomped uh, on how this was done. It was pretty amazing. All right, time for the outro. All right, so there it is, complete. I'm gonna have pictures right after this scene right here, so stay tuned. Um, I'm really proud of how it came out. Could I have gone farther? Yeah, I could have gone farther. But when you're trying to do a challenge uh, and you really want to add speed, when it comes to speed painting in this, um, you have to decide at what point you wanna cut off your project. I mean, like, okay, I'm satisfied with it, I can put it in my cabinet, I could put it on the table and I could be proud of it. And that's the level I'm at with this and I'm pretty happy with this. Would I enter it in a competition, a painting competition? Um, no, um, but will I, um, I mean, it'll look great on my table, so I'm really just proud of it. And that's what you need to do when you're coming to your speed painting and you're painting armies for, for speed, then you just have to be come to a point where you're just proud of it and then call it a day. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I have links to support the channel down below. Uh, I would like to thank our two Patreon me members, uh, which is Mike McBroom and Emily Yasesko. See, I got it right that time. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Patreon members, for supporting me. But even if you don't support me, uh, maybe share this uh, episode with somebody you think might be interested in something like this challenge. All right. I'm really happy you came hang out with me today. And if you like this video, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time on the Miniatures Paintbrush.